Sorry about that. Good morning. All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Hasmik Bagdasarian. I'm the Deputy Director of the Promised Armenian Institute. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our conference on Armenian Genocide, Looted Art and Restitution. To open the program, I'm going to introduce two individuals who will offer their welcoming remarks. First, we will hear from Dr. Angara Gozian, the inaugural director of the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA and distinguished professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering. Dr. Kara Gozian is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and has served on the U.S. Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. She is also the UC representative on the Board of Trustees of the American University of Armenia. After Dr. Garagosian, we will hear from Mark Mamigonian, the Director of Academic Affairs of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. Uh, Mark has served as an editor on the Journal for Armenian Studies and the volume on the Armenians of New England, published in 2004 by the Armenian Heritage Press. He has published articles in Genocide Studies International, the James Joyce Quarterly, the Armenian Review, Journal of the Society of Armenian Studies, and elsewhere. I am also happy to note that this important conference is co-sponsored by the Fowler Museum, where we are privileged to be today. The Promise Institute for Human Rights at the UCLA School of Law, the Magrublian Center for Human Rights at Claremont McKenna College, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, and the Institute for Transnational Law at the University of Texas Austin School of Law. We are very grateful for their support. Throughout this conference, my colleague, Nanor Haratunyan, the program coordinator of the Armenian Genocide Research Program, will serve as Master of Ceremonies. So without further delay, please welcome Dr. Ankara Gozian. Thank you, Hasmig, and let me also add my warm welcome to this very important conference, Armenian Genocide Looted Art and Restitution. As most of you know, this is a follow-on to last year's groundbreaking conference held here at UCLA called What's Next? Armenian Genocide Restitution in the Post-Recognition Era. Uh, last year's conference, in fact, uh, led to the establishment of the Armenian Genocide Looted Art Research Project, which you'll hear a great deal about today. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary collaborative research project which is aimed at fostering research on Armenian art, cultural heritage, and other cultural objects that were looted, destroyed, or transferred in connection with the Armenian genocide of the early 20th century, and also uh, aims at engaging in critical thinking and action on many dimensions of justice, dialogue, restitution, and repair pertaining to these losses. So I would like to um, offer my congratulations to the organizers of this conference and the project, especially our own uh, Armenian Genocide Research Program Director, Dr. Tanner Akjam. Uh, Professor Michael Basler of uh, Chapman University and Professor Hernar uh, Wattenpah of UC Davis. So we look forward to a very stimulating set of presentations, discussions, and even a documentary film showing, as you will see soon. Um, Hasmik has uh, indicated to you the co-sponsors of this event, and we are grateful for their support. On behalf of the co-sponsors here at UCLA, let me acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the indigenous Gabrielino Tongva peoples. It is a privilege for our institution to acknowledge the history of the land on which we are established. Before uh, Mark comes to the podium, let me just mention a couple of procedural items for the audience. Let me note that this event is being recorded for future viewing on our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute YouTube channel. And for those of you in the audience, when the talks or the sessions are completed, if you have questions, please just raise your hand and someone will come to you with a microphone and you can offer your question. For those of you watching on the Zoom webinar platform, if you have a question, just please uh, click on the green Q&A button and type in your question. 
in all cases, please try to make your questions as focused and succinct as pop possible, and we'll get to as many as we can. And finally, for those of you on Zoom, in the unlikely event that the Zoom webinar drops, uh, please just come back to the same link that you had at the beginning and you'll be brought back to our event. So now it gives me great pleasure to welcome our good friend, Mark Mamagonian, who as Hasmik said, is the Director of Academic Affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. And I will say personally has been an exceptional intellectual partner for all of us in the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute since our inception. So Mark, I will welcome you to the podium. And thank you, that's extremely kind, appreciate it. And we welcome the opportunity to work with the Promise Armenian Institute and, and all of our friends and partners at, at UCLA on this and, and indeed on, on many other things over the years, uh, right now, and hopefully into the future. Um, so on behalf of Nasser, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, it, it really is my privilege to be here to, to uh, participate and to listen today uh, to this follow up on last year's important conference and on the uh, valuable work that was done uh, over the past year by by a team of researchers to to which we'll be hearing about today and this is one of those projects that um, when when Tanner initially uh, approached me and approached Nasser about it uh, of course it seemed a foregone conclusion that we needed to support this, uh, partly because it was clear that no it wasn't an option as an answer uh, to Tanner. So uh, of course we had to say yes, but also because it was so self-evidently important that this work be done. Uh, over the past 25 or so years that I've been engaged in this kind of work, you stumble across things that make you think, really that hasn't been done before or why hasn't that been done before or how is it that we have come to this point only now that this work is is being done this isn't of course necessarily the subject of, of today's program but it is an interesting thing to ponder uh, all of the steps that needed to be taken all the hurdles that needed to be cleared and and uh, the mindset that had to be arrived at uh, that would allow this work finally to take place uh, and thank god we have reached that point and uh, we we've learned uh we, we've learned a lot and i we will learn a lot as the day goes on let me stop there because you don't need to hear me tell you what we've learned because the people who are actually here who have done the work can so thank you to the organizers especially to tanner and michael and hegnar and and nanor and everyone here at at, at promise institute Look forward to talking to you as the day goes on and thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Nanor Hartunyan and I am the program coordinator of the Armenian Genocide Research Program. Our next speaker, Dr. Tanit Akjam, is the director of the Armenian Genocide Research Program and someone I have the privilege of working alongside and learning from every day. Dr. Akjam is widely recognized as one of the first Turkish scholars to write extensively on the Armenian Genocide, and we are honored to have him as the director of our program. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Akjam. Thank you, Nanor, and thank you all other previous speakers. Uh, it is really a great honor for me to be here. You know, a, a dream is coming true, actually, uh, a dream that we had for a long time. And uh, I will tell in my talk also, this is just the beginning. We, this is a beginning of a long travel, long journey. So thank you for coming to our conference. And here are my remarks. The decades-long denial of the Armenian genocide by successive Turkish governments and subsequent recognition efforts 
of Armenians for this crime have long determined the agenda of Armenian communities and human rights activists. Since mid of 1960s, an Armenian genocide recognition movement emerged throughout the world. The Biden administration's recognition was a big turning point in this historic episode. This recognition, along with the high probability that the Turkish government will never recognize the Armenian genocide, put those involved in the recognition cause at a crossroad. The long-standing demand of recognizing the Armenian genocide, mainly directed to US government, is now obsolete. At times, it can be difficult for people to grasp the fact that the circumstances have changed and that repeating old methods doesn't work, actually. After recognition, the big question that remained for us was, what is next? New targets and prospects for the future are necessary. What could they be? On Saturday, March 25, 2023, UCLA hosted a conference pertaining to the Armenian genocide and restitution. It was historic in nature because it was the first conference to explore the possibilities of creating an Armenian genocide reparation movement in the post-recognition era. During the March conference, we had the honor of featuring Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt as our opening keynote speaker which the other organizers and I did intentionally to set the tone for the rest of the conference. Ambassador Eisenstadt discussed his critical efforts during the Clinton administration as special representative of the president and secretary of state on Holocaust era issues, as well as those of several successive US administrators in achieving some measures of justice for the post-Holocaust restitution movement. These words, some measures of justice. This is what we are seeking for also. In his remarks, Ambassador Eisenstadt gave conference participants an important directive. We must help create the right legal and political climate for the Armenian genocide restitution movement to grow and find solutions that recognize the historical suffering of the Armenian people. In response, the Armenian Genocide Research Program within UCLA under the academic leadership of art history professor Hegnar Wattenpaug of University of California, Davis, and law professor Michael Basler of the Chapman University Fowler School of Law spearheaded the Armenian Genocide Art Research Project, Lutut Art Research Project, AGLA. You have to memorize this word. Agla. This is first time when I came to LA. It was April 2022, and I was sitting in a restaurant with Michael, and he told me at that con at that table when we were having our lunch, we have to create Agla, Armenian Genocide Looted Art Project. This is where we are now. And this is a multidisciplinary collaborative research project aimed at fostering research on Armenian art, culture, cultural heritage, and other cultural objects that were looted, destroyed, or transferred in conjunction with the Armenian genocide by using several disciplinary methods. And second, engaging in critical thinking and action on the many dimension of justice, dialogue, restitution and repair regarding the losses of Armenian culture arising from the Armenian genocide. You will hear from some of the project's esteemed research team later today. We never forgot and are grateful for Ambassador Eisenstadt's directive stemming from the March conference and are honored to feature him once again as our keynote speaker. Genocide Genocides are not just mass murders. They are also mass theft. And looted art is only a small part of the destroyed and confiscated wealth. Naturally, we cannot address every dimension of restitution in this conference. Today, we would like to focus on a very specific aspect of the theft during the Armenian genocide, looted art, 
an important part of which consists of the plunder of Armenian sacred art. We have a very exciting program for you all today, which will consist of a documentary screening for our in-person audience only because of some technicalities, discussions of the AGLA research programs, summer research fundings, findings, and a round table on how this conversation applies to past and current events, as well as what lies next for our AGLA research project. The documentary, directed by filmmaker Carla Karabedian, she is with us today, recounts the proceedings of the March conference and provides key context for the research activities that follow. Following the screening, the conference will feature Ambassador Eisenstadt's remarks. We will then hear from law professor Lauren Fielder. She is with us here. Welcome from Texas, Lauren. Uh, and she has been teaching international and constitutional law across Texas, the United States, and the world since 2005. We all know about the recent developments in Arsakh losing the historic homeland and has also meant losing the cultural wealth of the Armenian people of the region. We will include this new aspect in our program by hearing from the, our dear friend, investigative researcher, Simon Maghakian, who writes and speaks on post-Soviet memory politics and cultural erasure and facilitates global conversation on protecting Armenian heritage in Arsakh. You will also hear from the world-renewed lawyer and genealogist, Randall Schoenberg, who helped recover Gustav, Gustav Klimt's portrait of Adala Bloch-Bauer that was stolen by the Nazis in 1938. He will reflect on Eisenstadt's remark and talk about his experiences. Later, the AGLA research project leadership and research team will discuss their respective impressions following the most recent phase of the research project. Finally, the round table will feature experts from a variety of fields to consider what the pursuit of restitution looks like for both past and present threats to cultural heritage objects and sites. We will set new goals and objectives for the future. The efforts of this conference will not end with this last session. Today is just a small stop station on a long journey. We consider this to be a small link in a long chain that will follow other conferences and projects. As I mentioned in the outset of my remarks, our main goal is to explore the possibilities of creating Armenian restitution movement and to contribute academically to its establishment. Within this framework, on the ultimate goal that we will strive for is to create, listen carefully please, a UCLA or Los Angeles Armenian genocide looted art principles, just like 1988 Washington Conference Principles of Nazi Confiscated Art. A statement concerning the restitution of art co confiscated by the Nazi regime in Germany before and during World War II. Another important goal should be to pass a law like the Holocaust Expropriated Art Recovery Act, which is known as HERE Act was passed by Congress 2016. We consider our efforts as a small contribution to such initiatives. Needless to add, neither the creating of Armenian genocide looted art principles nor working towards passing a law through Congress can be the task of academia. Armenian communities and their representatives would be the main carriers of such efforts. In our conversation with Stuart Eisenstadt, he underlined the fact that throughout these efforts, Armenian communities would face a central question. Who is your spokesperson? 
who represents you? And Armenian communities, like all other victim groups, must learn to unite their voices and become one despite their differences in order to claim their lost rights. This is a major task, and I am sure Armenian institutions are capable of overcoming this challenging task. Of course, the subject of reparation and restitution are broad and multidisciplinary, dimensional. We view the Holocaust restitution movement, which is also referred as the some measure of justice movement, as a great model for us. For this reason, it is incumbent upon us to look at the major stage of this movement to better understand what is expected of us. As my dear colleague Michael Basler has rightly put in several of his writings, there have been three major phases in the Holocaust reparation movement. It began immediately following the World War II. During this first period, the allied countries focused on recovering and returning assets stolen by the Nazis throughout Europe, including but not limited to Jewish property. Although this period saw the allies enacting multiple laws governing the seizure of assets owned or controlled by the Nazis and blocking the transfer of such assets, such efforts were only partially successful. Maybe you don't know this, but we had a similar process in the case of Armenian genocide. After the armistice of 1918, the Ottoman Empire was occupied by Allied powers, and the new post-war Ottoman government, along with the support of Allied powers, launched a program which stipulated to return all confiscated properties to original owners, or if the owners were killed, them to the owner's relatives. The policy of the Ottoman government then became Article 144 of the 1920 Treaty of Sevr, which the victory of Turkish nationalists, this process, with the victory of Turkish nationalists, this process ended with failure. The second phase of Holocaust, some measure of justice movement, began with the negotiations between Germany and Israel, which ended with the Luxembourg Agreement of 1952. Before the negotiations started, in 1951, 23 major international Jewish organizations jointly established the institution known as the Claim Conference, Conference on the Jewish Material Claims Against Germany. The organization embarked on an enormous struggle to locate and recoup millions of dollars of property, possessions, and works of art confiscated during the Holocaust. The work of the Claim Conference was followed by that of the World Jewish Restitution Organization, founded in the wake of Soviet Union's collapse. Like its predecessor, the World Jewish Restitution Organization occupied itself with the working to identify, locate, and return property and artwork from the Eastern Bloc countries and the procurement of reparation to Holocaust, for Holocaust survivors. There has never been such a process concerning the Armenian genocide. The Luxembourg Agreement is the missing link in the case of Armenian genocide. The most important reason for this was of course, the stubborn, ardent denial policies of successive Turkish governments that served as stumbling blocks for the proper restitution. There is, however, another missing link, and it is the fact that the Armenian organizations haven't come together to form their own claim commission yet. Despite the Turkish government's policy of denial, and even without using these as an excuse. Armenian organizations must succeed pulling together, in pulling together because it is not only the Turkish state that will be asked 
to fulfill justice. Even if it is a small part of justice, the Solomon issue of ensuring the return of the confiscated looted work of art and religious sacred artifacts scattered all over the world to their rightful owners is a serious undertaking. This reality, some measure of justice, is the spirit of the Agla research project. The third phase of the Holocaust, some measures of justice movement started in the second half of 1990s and was focused on litigation in the US courts. In the late 1990s, numerous civil lawsuits were filed against European public and private entities that sought restitution for material losses by pre-war European Jews and others. Even though some failed in most of these cases, the plaintiffs were successful. The Armenian Genocide Looted Art Research Project can be understood within this third stage, and it is my genuine hope that it will have a positive effect on the general reparation movement. I know that whatever solution or perspective is proposed in regard to reparations or restitutions, we can never fully replace what was lost. However, I believe that it is through efforts like this conference that some form of justice can be served to those who have suffered immeasurable losses. Thank you all for being here, and I look forward to the rest of today's proceedings. Welcome again. Our next speaker is Dr. Carla Garabedian, a filmmaker based here and in the UK. She received her doctorate from the London School of Economics and Political Science. You may know her through her film, Screamers. She works with the Armenian Film Foundation on many projects, including some with the Promise Armenian Institute. Carla is currently in production for her feature film, Nemesis 1921. Please note that the upcoming documentary screening is for in-person attendees only. So for those of you on Zoom, please do not log off and refer to our program for the time of our next segment. For now, please help me in welcoming Dr. Garabedian. So only a few words. Hello, everybody. Um, the film you're about to see was commissioned by the Promised Armenian Institute, and I have uh, to thank Professor Michael Basler, who actually had the idea to memorialize last year's conference on this subject matter, and to not only encapsulate, summarize what some of the speakers said, but to sort of mark the moment in time when there was so much news coming out, not just about Armenian genocide related matters, but looted art in general, cultural restitution in general, repatriation of art that was happening at such a breakneck speed that a couple of our participants were literally holding up newspapers saying, look what the headline is today. And I can even hold up a newspaper today from the New York Times just this week about the Fowler Museum returning, repatriating African art to Ghana, which you'll hear a little bit more about. The point is this, that there was so much going on last year, we thought it would be useful to have a film which memorialized the conference and which also helped us to understand some of the legal concepts that led up to that moment, some of the history, so that it would help us to move forward. So um, I would view the film as a kind of one hour lecture in uh, the background and the legal history of this subject matter, Armenian genocide, looted art and restitution. And I also wanna thank um, Maggie Mangasari and Goshen who's here today for um, allowing us to film at the R. Adeskijan Museum. Thank you, Maggie.
Greetings. Um, I'm deeply touched by this video and I want to make a personal comment before sharing Amy Landau's remarks. I'm very proud to say that the Fowler Museum has on exhibit the 14 indestructible needle laces of an Armenian genocide survivor, Ms. Mari Pilibosyan. And if you have time, please visit the gallery. And now I would like to share with you the remarks of Amy Landau, Director of Education and Interpretation. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Um, Amy Landau is the Director of Education and Interpretation at the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Unfortunately, due to totally unpredictable circumstances, she couldn't be here today. And yesterday afternoon, she asked me to read her remarks. It has been an honor to co-host this symposium with such um, esteemed colleagues. And I wish to offer a particular note of gratitude to our UCLA colleagues from the Promise Armenian Institute and the Promise Institute for Human Rights, as well as to my Fowler colleagues, Hannah Yu, who diligently has supported this event and Gassi Armenian. Before coming to UCLA, I served as a curator at the Walters Art Museum and was part of a collective who, drawing on the monumental work of Sirarpi Der Nersesian, transcribed and digitized the Walters Armenian manuscripts. The detailed colophones, inscriptions, notations, and stamps on these Armenian manuscripts are testament to the forced migrations, violent persecutions, and genocide of Armenians across time and geographies. Armenian inscriptions ceaselessly implore the beholder to remember. We interpret this supplicant, supplication with respect to an individual's piety and generosity to be remembered. We can also understand this enjoinder more broadly to encompass the whole human experience. Remember, I was here. Remember my joy as a family member. And remember my commitments and contributions to the Armenian community. And most significantly, remember these things in the face of mass force displacements and genocide. These are the memorials that must be heard again and again in museum galleries, which are public spheres for public memory, so that such atrocities stop happening. I'm honored to be part of a team at the Fowler committed to retelling the Armenian histories as so elegantly demonstrated by recent exhibitions curated by Gassia Armenian. Remain in light, visions of homeland and diaspora, and Zhanyag, Armenian art of knots and loops, up until April 7th. Fowler colleagues are equally committed to provenance research, repatriation, and restitution as represented in the NAGPRA efforts of our devoted staff. And this week's return of seven Asante objects to the current Asante King in Ghana. The repatriation of these works was led by the Fowler's 
Shirley and Ralph Shapiro Director, Sylvia Forni, Rachel Rayner, Director of Collections, and Erica Jones, Senior Curator of African Art. I deeply regret I cannot be with you today. I hope to collaborate with scholars across UCLA's campus and beyond to carry forth today's conversations. If you are interested in collaborating, please do reach out and talk with my Fowler colleagues, especially Hannah, you, and Gassia. Thank you. Thank you, Gassia and Amy. Uh, we will now break for lunch. So for those of us on Zoom, uh, please don't log off. We'll be back in one hour. And for those of us here, please help yourselves. Thank you.
got other crap in there.
Check one two hey hey one two 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 one two hey hey one two three four one two hey hey one two ooh, ooh. 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 Notched out big time. Ooh. Ooh.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our conference on Armenian Genocide, Looted Art and Restitution. 
I wanted to note that if any academic institutions want access to the documentary that we just screened to show it for educational purposes only, then please contact the Promise Armenian Institute and we will share the footage with you. It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the second year in a row, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, who you've heard about throughout this conference and who brings with him extensive experience in resolving Holocaust claims and related disputes. Thank you and please enjoy Ambassador Eisenstadt's pre-recorded remarks. Thank you for inviting me to make remarks at this important conference. I'm speaking in my personal capacity, not as a representative of the U.S. government or the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which I chair. I'm struck by the parallels between the genocide of the Jews during World War II and the genocide of the Armenians in 1915-16 during World War I, one of the first genocides of the 20th century. In the Holocaust, the Nazis and their collaborators killed six million Jews and millions of others, two-thirds of European Jewry, the flower then of the world Jewish culture and religion, and indeed one-third of the total Jewish population in the entire world. In the Armenian Genocide by the Ottoman Empire, an estimated one million Armenians living in the multi-ethnic Ottoman Empire were directly killed, died of exposure during deportation at the hands of the Ottomans uh, or otherwise uh, expired. This was done to solidify Muslim dominance in Central and Eastern Europe by eliminating the Armenian presence. It took years for the full dimensions of the Holocaust to be recognized, and even longer for efforts to restitute or compensate personal possessions, businesses and homes, art and cultural objects. And these still remain incomplete long after World War II. For the Armenians, this process has really yet to begin. One of the reasons has been the denial of the Armenian Genocide by successive uh, and successor Turkish governments. Hitler saw a parallel between the forgotten genocide of the Armenians and his plan to exterminate both Jews and non-Jewish Poles, disabled, Roma, Slavs, and others, which in Nazi racial hierarchy were considered untermenschen, subhumans. Prior to the Nazi attack on Poland, Hitler addressed his high command in Ober Salzburg and said that, and I quote, as it was quoted by a distinguished journalist, our war aim does not consist in reaching certain lines, but in the physical destruction of the enemy. Accordingly, I have placed, he said, my death head formations in readiness for present only in the East with orders to send to death mercilessly and without compassion men, women, and children of Polish derivation and language. Only thus shall we gain the living space, Lindenstrom, which we need. Who, after all, speaks today of the annihilation? of the Armenians. This statement by Hitler about the Armenians is on the top floor of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, near the photographs of what was done to the Poles. Recognition of the Armenian genocide has been slow in coming. It was only on April 24, 2021, Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day, that President Biden courageously recognized the Armenian Genocide, now along with some 30 countries. The Holocaust was not only the greatest genocide in world history, it was also the greatest theft of property, the expropriation and Aryanization of 
Jewish property was not random or incidental, but an integral part of the Nazis' plan to eliminate all vestiges of Jewish life in Europe, root and branch, homes and businesses, bank accounts and insurance policies, personal possessions like jewelry, artworks, cultural and religious objects. And they also worked to death slave laborers to help run their German war effort. Leading German banks and insurance companies became facilitators of the exploitation of Jewish assets and their purchase, sale, and insuring of Aryanized assets as part of their everyday business. Large numbers of ordinary Germans became involved in purchasing these confiscated Jewish assets, doing so on the cheap, from pots and pans to costly rugs and furnishings. In addition, a significant percentage of the German armed forces was financed by these looted Jewish assets. So too, the confiscation by the Ottomans of Armenian cultural and religious objects and artifacts and personal possessions was an integral part of the Armenian genocide. There's one major difference here. After the war in 1951, German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, the first post-World War II elected chancellor, personally and professionally accepted responsibility for the Holocaust in the name of the German people. And that led to the creation of the Jewish Claims Conference to negotiate on behalf of Holocaust survivors and the 1952 Luxembourg Agreement between the young state of Israel the then West German government and the Jewish Claims Conference. Importantly, that agreement is held now all the way through the 1950s, uh, 60s, 70s, into the 21st century, and indeed since 2009, I've been the principal negotiator for the Jewish Claims Conference for uh, Holocaust survivors with the German finance ministry as recently as uh, our last negotiation in May of 2023, and we'll have another one uh, this year in 2024. The difference is that there is no such comparable agreement to the Washington Agreement with the Armenian community and Turkey. The full dimensions of the Nazi theft, including art, only became known when the wall of silence on the fate of remaining looted art was breached after the end of World War II, as archives in the former Soviet Union and former communist East Bloc countries were finally opened. Four scholars in the 1990s wrote path-breaking books, Lynn Nicholas, Jonathan Petropoulos, Konstantin Akinsha, and Hector Feliciano, and Elizabeth Simpson organized a 1995 Bard Graduate Conference for Decorative Arts in New York entitled The Spoils of War, and this elevated this issue, which had been really silenced for so many decades. We learned that as many as 600,000 artworks and millions more of books and religious objects were stolen by the Nazis and their allies with the same efficiency, brutality, and scale as the Holocaust itself. They were, many of them, about 100,000, were collected, by the way, by the famous monuments men, art curators and historians embedded in the U.S. Army as the U.S. Army moved east toward Berlin, uh, and at President Truman's instance, collected some 100,000 of those 600,000 cataloged them and sent them back to the countries, not the individuals from whom they were stolen, because in the chaos of war, finding the actual owners was near impossible, in the hope that those countries would set up their own claims processes. Some did, and some were returned, but not nearly all, and they were then incorporated into their collections and into the private art markets and other museums. So, 
Hitler was an indifferent painter in his youth, and he wanted some several thousand of those 600,000, the most precious, reserved for what he was to call a Fuhrer Museum, the Fuhrer, a Fuhrer Museum in his hometown of Linz, Austria. Of course, that never materialized because the Allies won the war. He also kept priceless religious and cultural objects for a planned museum, as he called it, to a dead race in Prague. Just as the 1995 Bard Conference first elevated the confiscation of Nazi looted art during the Holocaust, so too, I hope that the UCLA conference uh, in, in, with Loyola in the spring of 2023, at which I gave a keynote speech, and your UCLA conference on February 10th of this year will do the same for looted Armenian sacred objects. Just as the four scholars helped raise the visibility of confiscated Holocaust era art, a forthcoming article by Hegner Zeitlin Vantapal may have a similar impact for the Armenian cause. She notes in words strikingly similar to the Nazi aims with Jewish art and culture and artifacts, the following, and I quote her, the destruction of the cultural heart heritage of Armenians and especially their religious culture was a central element of the Armenian genocide. As churches and monasteries were destroyed, many of their Middle e medieval treasures were looted. Some eventually entered the international art market. Some American collectors even organized trips for the express purpose of buying as much of the cultural heritage of Ottoman Christians as possible before it disappeared. Today, works of Armenian art can be found, she said, in museums and collections around the world. Today, works of medieval Armenian sacred art that have missing provenance or raised questions about their collection to events of the genocide can be found in many private and public collections, including, she noted, but not limited to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Walters Museum in Baltimore, the University of Michigan, as well as private collections. The Armenian looted art is not covered by our Washington principles of Nazi confiscated art, which I negotiated in 1998 with over 40 countries. But the moral and ethical principles behind them should prevail here. And they recently led countries to examine art and cultural objects confiscated during their colonial period. For example, Germany has returned the famous Benin cultures to Nigeria. France has established a commission to look at art taken during their colonial period, and the Netherlands and Belgium have done likewise. Dr. Wattenpaw mentions litigation between the Armenian Church against the J. Paul Getty Museum, which was settled satisfactorily in 2015. However, it'll take more than this one conference and Dr. Wapdenpa's manuscript to make real progress on Armenian looted art. On Nazi confiscated art, there were congressional hearings chaired by Banking Committee Chairman James Leach, Republican in Iowa, in the House Banking Committee, in which Philippe de Montemello, the director of the Met in New York, testified on behalf of the Association of Art Museum Directors, the AAMD. Congressman Leach challenged him and the AMD, which represented some 170 American museums, to come up with guidelines for provenance research, identification and restitution, compensation or other solutions for Nazi looted art. We, in effect, internationalized those in the Washington principles on Nazi confiscated art in 1998. It may facilitate your efforts to recognize how much has been done as a result of our voluntary Washington principles. One, nations, five of them, Austria, Germany, France, 
the Netherlands, and Britain have created claims commissions to provide a forum for heirs to try to recover art confiscated from their families. These commissions each publish their decisions and in the last several years have formed a network to share experience and knowledge to guide best practices. They meet regularly and publish a biennial newsletter, which is of great value also to countries which still have no national claims process. These might eventually create guidelines for fair and just solutions. With the mixed experience of over 10 years, in June 2009, these Washington principles were strengthened by the 47 nation Theresen Declaration at the Prague Holocaust Era Assets Conference organized by the Czech government with the strong support of the U.S. government, and I led that delegation and helped negotiate the Theresen Declaration. The concept of confiscation in the Washington Principles was broadened to include forced sales and sales under duress. Recognizing that many Jews and other Nazi targets were forced to sell their artworks to get funds to pay exit taxes and visas, private institutions and individuals, not only public museums, were encouraged to support the Washington Principles. And recognizing that restitution could not be accomplished without the knowledge of potential looted cultural property, the Theresen Declaration placed increased emphasis on intensified systematic provenance research. Nations were urged to ensure that their legal systems facilitated just and fair solutions and that claims were resolved expeditiously on their merits. This was followed by the Vilnius International Forum on Holocaust Era Looted Cultural Assets in January 2000, which provided additional focus on Nazi looted art and cultural and religious objects. In 2022, again with the leadership of the Czech government, the Theresen II conference was held, reaffirming the Theresen Declaration now by 35 countries. The U.S. Congress on a bipartisan basis has been particularly supportive of Holocaust art and cultural restitution. Concern that American museums were using the statute of limitations to deny recovery of Nazi looted art, which I think was in violation of the spirit of the Washington principles. Congress passed the 2016 HERE Act, creating a unique federal statute of limitations for six years that would only begin when a claimant had reason to know of the Nazis' theft of their family art. In addition, in 2018, Congress passed the so-called JUST Act, Justice for Uncompensated Survivors Today, which called on the State Department to report on the implementation of the Theresen Declaration by its signatory countries. The State Department undertook an exhaustive study in which I was directly involved by its embassies and in 2020 reported on the implementation of the Theresen Declaration. Among other things, our State Department report found that after a promising start on provenance research, art restitution and the creating, creation of a portal connecting over 170 museums to facilitate claims to Nazi confiscated art. Despite that promising start, American museums had begun asserting affirmative defenses to block restitution of looted art in contravention of the Washington Principles and the Theresen Declaration, which was decisions should be made on the merits, not on technicalities. They were lagging in conducting also provenance research and had antiquated software, which complicated the identification of potential Nazi looted art in the hands of American museums by heirs and claimants. In addition, on the 20th anniversary of the Washington Principles, to encourage more art recovery in Germany, I signed, along with then Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues, Tom Yazdegardi, a 2018 memorandum of understanding with the German Federal Commissioner for Culture and the Media, Monica Gruders, 
This quadrupled funds to German museums for provenance research, envisioned ending the statute of limitations for Holocaust art claims, and committed to denying federal subsidies for publicly supported museums, which refused to participate in claims cases for restitution. Again, with the intervention of the US government, international organizations and the leadership of the Dutch government, in 2022, the Netherlands reversed their backsliding by their museums and their claims commission by ending what they called their balance of interest test, which had allowed Dutch museums to keep Nazi looted art if its importance to their collection was determined to outweigh the interests of the heirs. This fortunately was ended by the government of the Netherlands. In addition, there's been some progress in Israel, Luxembourg, which recently agreed to a comprehensive restitution program, and Switzerland. Croatia is moving in the right direction following a report by the World Jewish Restitution Organization, the WJRO, and intervention by the U.S. government. They've restituted paintings plundered by the pro-Nazi Ustashi regime from the Reichmann family. Christie's, led for years by Monica Dugo and now by Richard Arnowitz, and Sotheby's, led by Lucien Simmons, have created full-time restitution staffs and changed their consignment agreements to give them the right to review all art consigned to them for sale or auction that passed through European hands between 1933 and 1945 to make sure that they're not dealing in Nazi looted art. And now they will not sell those with suspicious provenance. Christie's alone has resolved over 300 claims and recently decided to broaden their provenance research to include how the wealth of those seeking to sell their art was acquired during the Nazi era. Sotheby's has also returned many paintings, and Sotheby's has partnered with the Louvre in Paris to help pay for their provenance research. A new profession of provenance researchers has developed, and new organizations like the London-based Commission for Looted Art were created to represent the victims and identify, locate, and recover their looted cultural property. This commission has also created a database of over 25,000 looted art and cultural objects. There's also a database of art objects at the Jeu de Palme in Paris, so-called ERR database. Both of these databases show what objects were taken, from whom, and their fate. Other databases include the German Lost Art Database and a new Jewish Digital Cultural Recovery Project Foundation in Berlin. And in December, this developed by the Claims Conference and the World Jewish, Rest or Jewish Restitution Organization, an international digital platform for archival documentation, research, and education on the widespread plunder by the Nazis and their allies of Jewish-owned artworks and cultural heritage projects. France has recently shown commendable leadership. In July of last year, 2023, they passed a law permitting the deaccession from their museums of Nazi looted artwork and state collections. Until then, each successful claim required an individual law to enable the restitution to take place. The Commission for the Compensation of Victims of Spoilation, the CIVS, whose anniversary uh, in Paris I addressed in 2019, was given authority over looted art, and recommendations on restitution now go to the Prime Minister's office itself. In 2022, the French Senate restituted 15 artworks in its collection, and five more have been returned so far this year. This is having a profound impact also on Italy, as the World Jewish Restitution Organization is working with the Italians on deaccession laws regarding uh, the facility of deaccessioning 
artworks and facilitating restitution. The Washington principles, as I mentioned, have also had a ripple effect unexpectedly as Germany, France, and Netherlands, and the UK, and other countries are reviewing their colonial art confiscation. As I mentioned, for art and cultural objects confiscated during their colonial period, Germany recently returned priceless Benin bronzes to Nigeria, and the French prime minister has a commission to review their positions, possessions, and the Dutch and Belgians are likewise examining their colonial possessions. As we have had the 25th anniversary of the Washington Principles, 14 nations have been working on a document providing what we call best practices from lessons learned over those 25 years on just and fair solutions and encouraging restitution or compensation or other fair and just solutions. We will have a conference in March to announce these best practices. Your challenge is to prick the conscience of the world to do something that happened even further back than the Holocaust and that only in the 21st century is being discussed. The Armenian uh, Museum in uh, Yenova is a welcomed museum on the genocide of Armenians, but it's not yet at the level of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Most crucially, you should have art research experts do provenance research to determine and then publicize which museums hold Armenian artifacts and books, manuscripts and religious objects, artworks. Without provenance research, nothing is possible. That's really crucial. Publicity is the most important way to put an ethical and moral spotlight on the need to find a just and fair solution to your restitution, compensation, or other means of fair and just solutions. Museums are sensitized these days to the reputational damage to whole looted art, and that should apply not just to Nazi looted art, but to Armenian looted objects. Publicity is more than half the battle. The theme of my work on Holocaust negotiations is that historical facts can be covered up and suppressed for a very long time, but in the end, they have a way of bubbling up. And when they do, there is a desire to do justice, however belated, which is why I entitled my book on my Holocaust negotiations, Imperfect Justice. The same should apply for your cause. I believe that uncovering facts that have been hidden for decades, even for a century, and bringing them to the harsh light of justice will lead to everyone coming out the winner, even the museums that have to give up their Armenian artifacts. I applaud your conference for trying to uncover and publicize the brutality that occurred in connection with the Armenian genocide and hope that your efforts can do as much as possible to bring justice to an imperfect world. Thank you for allowing me to give this keynote address, and I wish you good luck. Thank you to Ambassador Eisenstadt for lending your voice to our conference today. Our next speaker, Mr. Randall Schoenberg, is an attorney in Los Angeles who specializes in legal cases related to the recovery of looted or stolen artworks, particularly those by the Nazi regime during the Holocaust. He represented the plaintiff in the groundbreaking case to recover six famous Klimt paintings from, from the Republic of Austria that had been stolen by the Nazis. This case was the subject of the well-known film, Woman in Gold, that was released in 2015. Mr. Schoenberg also produced the recent documentary, Fioretta, an exploration of 500 years of family history. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Schoenberg. So speak from here. Uh, should we turn on the, the slides? Thank you so much. 
for the invitation uh, from my neighbor, Anne Serafian, the professor, uh, uh, to be at this conference today. It's, um, it's an extremely important topic, and uh, as someone who has dealt quite a bit of my own family history, including the Holocaust and the genocide against the Jews, I think it's important to recognize uh, the Armenian genocide um, and the actions which have continued up to the present day. I don't think there's really been enough discussion of the current ethnic cleansing that's going on um, against Armenians in, uh, in that neighbor area with Azerbaijan. So I wanted to mention that uh, today, that that is um, on my mind and I think should be on more people's mind. So let me tell you a little bit about Maria Altman's case sort of quickly. Um, I have a lot of things I would stay, say um, in his comment or response to Stuart Eisenstadt. So if I get through this, uh, maybe we'll have time for that or some questions at the end. But I'll give you a little taste of what the Altman case was like uh, in the recovery of the Klimt paintings. So uh, let's see if this works. Here's my client, Maria Altman, as she lived in, in Culver City, uh, or she sorry, Cheviot Hills. Rain, a little off today. Uh, here she is uh, with a reproduction of the portrait of her aunt, Adela Blochbauer. And she called me in 1998. She was my grandmother's best friend and uh, family had known each other forever. Actually, Maria, I should mention, had told me she went to school with Manon Gropius, who was the daughter of Walter Gropius, the architect, and Alma Mahler, who divorced Walter Gropius and then married Franz Werfel. And whenever I meet Armenians, I always mention that my family also was very close with Alma Mahler and, of course, Franz Werfel, who, who came and lived in Beverly Hills, about a mile away from here, uh, but was very famous in your community for writing his novel, 40 Days of Musadag, uh, in 1933. And it was the fame of that novel that led Hitler to make that statement on the, uh, the forgotten nature of the Armenian genocide in 1939, preparing for the advance on, on Poland. Um, so in honor of Franz Werfel, who all, also turns out to have been a third cousin of my grandfather, Arnold Schoenberg, who, who taught here at UCLA. I don't think they knew that. Their, their great-grandmothers on the maternal side were sisters, but you know, names change, and I don't think they were aware of that. But yes, he is also a cousin. Anyway, back to Maria Altman. Uh, and here she is, and she told me the story of her family and, and these famous paintings. This is her aunt and uncle. There were two brothers named Bloch who married two sisters named Bauer, and they became Bloch Bauer. Uh, the younger siblings were Ferdinand and Adela. Maria was the youngest child of the older siblings. And uh, Ferdinand had a sugar company in Vienna that became very, very successful. And he was able to buy lots of neat stuff, including a beautiful home right near the opera in Vienna, if you ever go there. Um, they had dozens and dozens of old paintings, 19th century Austrian style paintings, uh, a Rodin sculpture. They had the largest collection of antique Austrian porcelain in the world, over 300 settings. So each cup and saucer was a setting, uh, absolutely gorgeous. They had a nice little summer house. Uh, this one outside of Prague is uh, famous because it was taken from the Blochbauers and then used as the residence for Reinhard Heydrich, who some of you may know is the architect of the final solution of the genocide against the Jews. He was living in this house uh, when he plotted the extermination of all the Jews and was famously assassinated a few months later by Czech partisans. Um, this house, just to give you an idea, has never been returned to the family. All the artworks, um, the Czechs say they can't find them. Uh, so back to the Klimt paintings, this is Gustav Klimt. He was the most famous, uh, most expensive painter at the time around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century and uh, famously painted in a long smock with nothing on underneath. Uh, when he died at the flu epidemic in 1918, he had, I think, 18 illegitimate children who claimed that he was the father, so he had something of a reputation. And Ferdinand uh, commissioned him to do a portrait of his young wife, Adela. This is the famous uh, gold portrait. There, five years later, another portrait of Adela, so she's the only person to have two full-length portraits. They also collected a number of other landscape paintings, this early birch forest or beechwood, um, apple trees, houses in Unterbach am Attersee, and uh, this beautiful third of four paintings on, on this lake in Austria. 
Uh, Adela, unfortunately, died very young in 1925. She was 42 years old, and she had written a handwritten will asking her husband in the lower right corner there um, to give the two portraits and four landscapes by Klimt after his death to the Austrian State Gallery, which was a new museum formed after World War I in Austria to house Austrian art. Um, she was a big supporter of uh, social causes, sort of a socialist socialite, because of course they were very wealthy, but she supported the, also in the same sentence, she wanted her library to go to the People's and Workers Library. So she's a big supporter of the new socialist government and wanted the paintings to go to the museum after her husband died. Uh, here's a picture of the museum. It's one of the old Habsburg summer palaces. You can still go there today, known as the Belvedere. Uh, and uh, Ferdinand actually gave one of the paintings to the museum in, in the 30s, uh, that last uh, painting on a lake of a castle on a lake. Um, but of course, in 1938, uh, everything changed from one day to the next. The Nazis took over and Jews were, were even very wealthy Jews, or especially very wealthy Jews, were turned into targets. And Ferdinand had to flee the country, fled first to uh, his estate in Czechoslovakia. And within a year, the Nazis had occupied Czechoslovakia. And so he fled to Zurich, Switzerland, where he remained uh, sort of penniless and put up in a hotel by friends until the end of the war. And he died a few months after the war ended. Um, in 1939, so this is after the infamous Anschluss, the annexation of Austria in March of 38, uh, so you know, less than a year later, there was a meeting held in Ferdinand's home where they listed all of the artworks in his collection. I think there's, one, there's a little pointer. Oh, I can't point to it. Anyway, you can see this one page here first. Um, and the, uh, the purpose of this meeting was that there was a, a lawyer who was appointed, Dr. Eric Fuhrer, who was a big Nazi. Uh, and he, his job was to liquidate all of Ferdinand's property. So all the houses, the sugar company, the artworks, et cetera. And he held a meeting with the local museums uh, in the house to basically divvy up and divide up the, the paintings, the property. And Hitler also sent a representative, uh, Stuart Eisenstadt mentioned that Hitler also liked to collect art. He didn't like the Klimt paintings, they were a little too modern, but some of the other ones he was interested, Goering wanted some of the others. Uh, and the museums divided up the paintings. So they went to various museums. After the war, as I mentioned, Ferdinand had died. His niece Maria had managed to escape. If you see the movie, it's actually a, a relatively good representation of that. Uh, her husband, not in the film, her husband was actually sent to Dachau over the summer, which was the uh, Nazi concentration camp in uh, near Munich, and was uh, his brother was able to ransom him out, and then they escaped uh, in 1938. So she survived, and her older siblings managed to survive. The older brothers went to Canada. Uh, she had a sister who remained in Yugoslavia with her husband and their two children. They managed to hide from the, the Nazis in Yugoslavia, the Ustasha, uh, where almost all Jews were killed in Yugoslavia, but they managed to survive that, came out of hiding, and her husband, Maria's brother-in-law, was then arrested by the communists and executed for being a capitalist criminal. Uh, Maria's sister then escaped with her young children, first to to Palestine at the time. She was there when the uh, State of Israel was established and then joined the rest of the family on the West Coast in Vancouver. So it was up to Maria and her sister and one of her brothers who were named as heirs in her uncle's last will to try to recover the property. And what happened, sort of long story short, trying to make it short for, for this audience, um, after the war, they had a lawyer who was trying to collect as much property as they could from, from the uh, uh, the former estate, um, found Hitler had taken one of the paintings, that type of thing, that all happened, but also uh, contacted the local museums and said, I understand you may have something from the Blochbauer family. And the, uh, the museum said, well, yes, we have uh, a few of the Klimt paintings, but we don't have all of them. And we were promised all of them in the will of Adela Blochbauer when she died in 1925. And so unless you bring us the rest of the paintings, we're gonna sue the family. So they took a very aggressive approach. Uh, this was in 1948. Uh, just to give you the timing of it, the Nazi period <clears throat> in Austria is 38 to 45. It wasn't until 1948, so three years after the war, that the first restitution laws were passed in Austria, allowing Jews to recover their property. So right in the beginning of 1948, 
the family lawyer got received this very aggressive letter from from the museums and he decided then to try to make a deal and what happened was he had recovered some of the other paintings not the Klimt paintings um, and he wanted to send them to his clients in Canada and the United States and he knew that the Austrians wouldn't let paintings out of the country they had a patrimony law as many countries do that limits the exportation of artworks and what Austria was doing after the war to Jewish families who were trying to recover property is they basically played a game of extortion. They said, you cannot take your property out of Austria. So most of the people didn't want to go back uh, and live there, just as I think Armenians probably weren't so excited about moving back to Turkey. And, uh, but they wanted their property out. And when the Austrian government said, no, you can't take the property out, they would appeal. And then the Austrians would say, well, if you wanted to donate some of your property to our museums, we might let you take other things out. And so the family lawyer did one of these deals where he gave up on the Klimt paintings uh, and was able to get other paintings out. And he had concerns about the, the uh, meaning of Adela's will. It was considered already at the time in 1926 not to really be binding on her husband. Uh, and he also felt that, but he thought he needed to make a deal to get property out. And so if you, if you had asked Maria Altman, in 1998, so 50 years after she escaped from Austria, uh, what had happened to the Klimt paintings of your family? And she would have said to you, well, it's too bad. My aunt you know, left this will giving them to the museum and we never got them. Uh, and because that was the story that she had been told. So things changed then in 19, around 1998, 97, 98. Uh, and it coincides a little bit, but is a little bit independent of what Stuart Eisenstadt was talking about. There was an exhibit in New York at the end of 1997 involving another Austrian museum and uh, another artist named Egon Schiele. And two families claimed that uh, artworks on loan to that exhibit had been looted from their family. And there was an article in the New York Times by Judy Dobrinsky. And this is one thing I agree very much with, with Stuart Eisenstadt. The publicity is sort of more, more than 50% of the story here. So this New York Times article then led the uh, district attorney in Manhattan, Robert Morgenthau, to order his troops to go in and seize the paintings. And so they actually filed a lawsuit at the end of 1997, declaring that these paintings were, were looted paintings. And this caused a big uproar. First of all, MoMA was very upset. The Museum of Modern Art in New York said, huh, we can't be accused of this. And also the Austrians said, no, you know, we don't have looted artworks. Everything was returned after the war. We can't be accused of things like this. And there was a journalist, a really crusading journalist named Hubertus Chernin. And he decided to test this theory, this statement by the Austrian cultural minister. And he went into the archives and he found the evidence. And he found the evidence of this extortionate practice that was inflicted on not just the Blochbauer family, but also the Austrian branch of the Rothschilds and the Laders and all these other big Austrian Jewish art collecting families had gone through the same type of extortionate procedure. And so he wrote an expose. It was, it was a series of, I think, eight articles over several weeks. And to their credit then, the Austrians decided to pass a new law to reverse this and, and sort of save face. Uh, and I think that's what drives a lot of countries to do sort of the right thing. They passed a law saying, if we have in our federal collections artworks that were taken during the Nazi period and not returned because of this extortionate procedure, we're going to return them. And it's really thanks to Hubertus's work that that happened. That was announced then in September 98. It's when Maria Altman, my grandmother's best friend, called me. And later in 1998, they had that Washington conference that Stuart Eisenstadt likes to talk about, uh, which basically is a lot of words that didn't help anybody. But this law was really something good. And so initially I was trying to help Maria work through this law. They had set up a commission to decide what property return. Uh, not a single Jew on the committee. Okay, that's the way the Austrians do things. And uh, very quickly they gave back lots of less valuable things to the Austrian Rothschilds. But when they got to the Blochbauer case, they decided not to give back the Klimt paintings. They gave back some porcelain and some Klimt drawings, but not the paintings. And the excuse they gave was this will of Maria's aunt that was written in 1923. Uh, and it was at that stage that I, we had to decide what to do, right? So we said, well, maybe we can file a lawsuit in Austria. Well, it was prohibitively expensive to file a lawsuit in Austria. You have to put up a bond 
to cover all of the potential court costs of the other side. So in this case, it would have been several million dollars because they factor sort of the value of the property at stake in the litigation. Uh, so much more than Maria Altman and Chevy at Hills could afford. And I uh, was working at a big firm at the time and I thought, well, I really would like to pursue this some more for Maria, but my firm did not want uh, to, to pursue it and do anything. And I decided uh, that I would go out on my own. Fortunately, my wife was supportive of that. And, we, and I went out um, and opened my own office. And one of the first things I did was I filed a lawsuit for Maria Altman against the Republic of Austria. And in that case, I was relying on Professor Basler's uh, work. He had the longest running case in the Ninth Circuit, a case involving a, an Argentine Jewish family where they had sued the Republic of Argentina. And in that case, it said that you could, they, they had relied on a statute called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of 1976, which says that you can sue a foreign country, ordinarily you can't, they're immune, but you can sue a foreign country in a case concerning property taken in violation of international law, where the property is owned or operated by an agency or instrumentality of a foreign state that is engaged in a commercial activity in the United States. So if you break that apart, property taken in violation of international law, I figured, okay, the Nazis taking this, that was in violation of international law, potentially. Um, is it owned or operated by an agency or instrumentality of a foreign state? Well, yes, it's, it's owned by the Republic of Austria, but it's operated by this museum, this Austrian state museum has the, has the paintings. Um, is that museum engaged in a commercial activity in the United States? Well, I looked around and I found a book that they published with Yale University Press. Uh, they advertised, they accepted US credit cards and relying on uh, Professor Basler's work in the Cederman case, I thought, well, we could, we could maybe do this. And so I filed this lawsuit against Austria. Now Austria, of course, hired a big law firm to represent it and uh, try to dismiss the case on a number of different grounds. But the use of this Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, what they call the expropriation exception, was um, the, real, the big issue at that time in the very beginning of the case. And they were able to appeal that after we won in the district court up to the Ninth Circuit. And I argued for the very first time in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, no one expected me to win. I think maybe not even Michael, I'm not sure. Uh, but the Ninth Circuit miraculously ruled in our favor and said we could use this statute that was written in 1976 in a case concerning claims that originated in the 1930s and 40s. That was the issue, whether it was impermissibly retroactive to use this, this new statute. And so we went in the Ninth Circuit. I thought, well, great, right? We're, in, we're off to the races. Uh, but Austria petitioned for rehearing, and then the US government intervened against us. Uh, they were not very happy with this uh, decision in the Ninth Circuit. And fortunately, the Ninth Circuit didn't reconsider. But when Austria petitioned to the Supreme Court to hear the case, uh, it was taken up. And again, all bets were off. Uh, I have a picture of us. Maria, it's almost 20 years to the day, right? Uh, that we were there, had a little more hair than today. Um, and, uh, and I went to Washington and argued, of course, for the first time for me, for my grandmother's best friend in the United States Supreme Court, trying to make the argument that we could file a lawsuit against a foreign country here in Los Angeles, in federal court, using this Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And um, arrayed against us was not just Austria, but the US government and many other countries uh, wrote briefs uh, against us. So I went and argued last in the Supreme Court because we had won before. And by the time I got up to speak, it seemed at least that the justices were entertaining our argument. And I, I did not have high expectations. I was really hoping that at least Justice Ginsburg would be on my side. Uh, that I didn't want to be losing 9-0 in the Supreme Court. Uh, but I was feeling pretty good, and I had been instructed to, to start my, uh, my presentation, because you don't give a speech sort of uninterrupted. They're constantly interrupting and asking questions uh, by giving an outline. So I said, ground one of affirming the Ninth Circuit is, and I said one sentence, and it was immediately interrupted by Justice Souter, who was at the time, I think, the most intelligent member of the court. And he started asking me this long, convoluted question. 
And to me, it sounded like da 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 da. Like I, I had no idea what he was asking. You can hear this; it's taped, so I can't lie about it. You can go online and hear it. And and there's this long pause, and I said, you know, um, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't think I understood the question. You can hear gasps in the background, you know, like a like a skater who fell on the first jump, right? And but it was. It was the best response because all the other justices smiled as if to say, oh, thank goodness you asked. We didn't understand it either. You know, he, he does that all the time. Uh, and he was very gracious and he, he rephrased the question. I sort of understood what he was getting at. And the rest of the argument went sort of like a dream because I had immediately established my credibility. I wasn't pretending to be the world's expert on restitution and sovereign immunity and retroactivity and all these things. I was you know, a kid representing my grandmother's best friend in this completely crazy case. And so I just answered the questions as best I could. And I floated out of the courtroom. And for the first time, my dad, who was a retired judge, said, you know, you might even have a chance of winning. Uh, and so then we waited. We waited, uh, I think, three, four months. It was in June of 2004. And I got a phone call from a journalist. And they had just announced the decision. And, as, and so I said, uh, Okay, you know, give me the bad news. I was prepared for losing. And he said, no, not bad news. You won. 6-3 decision. Justice Stevens wrote the opinion. I think I dropped the phone because I don't remember the rest of the conversation. Uh, I raced over to Maria's house because her phone was off the hook already. And we embraced and hugged and kissed. And her, friend, her friends and family came over. And everybody was celebrating. And after a while, we realized, what did we win? Right? We won the right to start the litigation. This is now six years into the case. So the case then went on, and the following year, we were, we were required to do a court-ordered mediation. At, up to this point, seven years, Austrian government had refused to sit down and talk with us, never would discuss the case with us. And um, you know, I had repeatedly asked, uh, but refused. And so I thought this was going to be a formality, and I went into it with Maria saying, don't expect anything, we're just gonna show up and it's gonna be over. But they brought, I allowed them to bring their own mediator, they brought their own mediator, who was a historian from, from Austria. And he, immediate, he started out by saying, I sense that both sides want this over with. And you know, my client was 89 years old at the time. And of course, we wanted it over with. And Austria, I guess, wanted to be out of the US court system. And so they offered to do a mediation with three Austrian, uh, sorry, an arbitration with three Austrian arbitrators in Austria. And I pulled Maria aside into another room. And I said, isn't this great? We can do an arbitration. I've been, I asked them to do this you know, seven years ago and they refused and ignored it. And uh, this is wonderful. And she said, are you kidding? Why would I want my case to go back to Austria and be decided by Austrian judges when everybody in the US loves us, right? The Supreme Court. And, and I said, Maria, you're, you're almost 90 years old. If you want this case decided in your lifetime, we have to take this chance because I knew that the court procedure in the United States would drag on and drag on as it did in, in Professor Basler's case, in the Cederman case. Uh, and we had many other hurdles to get over, statute of limitations, act of state doctrine, all of these other evidentiary issues, proving something 80 years ago, et cetera, not to mention the issue of, of her aunt's will. And I said, in this case, we can just litigate the issue in the will, which I think is the, is the issue we're going to win. So Maria, Fortunately, was, well, she trusted me, and, uh, and so we went, I went then to Austria. It's not like in the movie. It wasn't a big audience. I was there uh, with, just with a, a local Austrian lawyer helping me and a, and a translator, although my German's pretty good. And we did an, a day-long arbitration in front of three arbitrators. I had picked one, Austria had picked another, and those two had picked the third, two professors, and I had picked a lawyer. And we waited and waited and waited for a decision. And finally, in January uh, 2006, I was returning home. I live right nearby here from a, a neighborhood poker game, a little dejected because I lost a little money. And uh, there on my phone was, was a message from the arbitrator. So I raced inside to, to look at that. And we won. We won the case unanimously. All three arbitrators agreed that, as our claim was, that Maria's aunt in her will made a request to her husband that was not binding on him. And therefore, when he died, after the paintings had been taken from him and did not give them the paintings in his will, understandably, to the Austrian government, uh, they still belonged 
to his estate. And they were essentially traded away for export permits after the war as part of this extortionate procedure. Uh, so then we celebrated. Uh, that was in, in 2006. Some of you may, have, may remember we quickly um, got the paintings out of Dodge as fast as possible, right? Uh, I got a call from, from the LA County Museum of Art curator Stephanie Barron and, and uh, I said, hey, how'd you like to bring the paintings here for an exhibit? She said, great. And I said, well, get them out. And so the LA County Museum of Art helped us bring the, bring the paintings very quickly to Los Angeles. And that was really the best um, moment for me uh, to see Maria Altman with her her family and, and friends in front of these paintings. Again, you know, she had grown up with them, visiting her aunt and uncle in their house, seeing them in this room after her aunt had died. And to have them back uh, and all in one place again with her was really uh, a remarkable experience for me. You know, Maria and I never really expected to win. We did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. And we did it because we wanted to set the record straight uh, and teach people the history. And I remember saying to Maria when we were in Washington at the Supreme Court, I said, you know, win or lose, there's now going to be a case that's going to have the entire history of what happened to these paintings. Uh, and, you know, regardless of what sovereign immunity and retroactivity and all those legal issues say, people are going to know what happened to your family. And that was really a huge part of the motivation for us in, in doing this. Now we won very unexpectedly, and um, then the family had to decide what to do with these amazing artworks. Uh, one of them went to the Neue Gallery, so you can see it uh, in New York. It's on 86th and 5th. Uh, they also, the next year, were given back these two statues, which are also in that list that I showed you from 1939. Um, but they're not, there was no description of them. It just said sort of two statues by this Belgian artist. Uh, the museum took them a while, but they've put two and two together and realized that they had been photographed together in 1907. And so they gave the statues back to the family and the family donated them to that museum. Anyway, that's the story of the recovery of the Klimt paintings. I, I wanted to, if we have time to maybe open up for questions or make a few comments about some other cases. Um, uh, so do we have a few minutes left? Is that, is that okay? Uh, so the family actually owned another Klimt painting, this portrait of Amalia Zirkerkandl. It's a woman who was murdered by the Nazis. Uh, with one of her daughters. And it's listed first on that inventory in 1939 at that meeting when the Nazis were in Ferdinand's house. That painting was subject to a second arbitration with the same judges. Uh, in this second arbitration, the woman in, in the painting, her heirs, her grandchildren uh, who had survived, uh, made a claim that it should re be returned to them, even though the painting was in Ferdinand's house. Uh, and the Austrians, I think, used that, the same arbitrators that I had trusted to do the first case uh, ruled against us and actually decided not to return this painting. They, they did so arguing that we could not prove exactly what happened to the painting after that 1939 meeting. In other words, they put the burden on the heirs, on the Blochbauer family to show what the Nazis did with, the, with this painting. We knew what happened to the other paintings, but this one, went somehow to an art dealer and then she kept, she sold it to her husband and kept it for 60 years and then donated it to the museum. And because we couldn't prove exactly how the painting left, uh, they wouldn't give it back. And that painting is still on the walls of the Austrian gallery in the Belvedere, a uh, hundred percent looted painting as far as I'm concerned. And I'm still outraged by it, but it shows you what can happen. To bring it a little closer to home, you may recognize these paintings. Uh, they are normally hanging in the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena. These paintings were taken by, the, uh, by Hermann Goering uh, uh, from the Houtsticker family, from Jacques Houtsticker. He died fleeing the Nazis, uh, going over the English Channel. The seas were rough and he fell on the boat and died. His widow and his young widow um, and one-year-old son survived and tried to get this and 200 paintings back from the Dutch. Uh, they were sort of swindled out of them. This happened very commonly when the original owner didn't live long enough to make the claim, right? So Ferdinand Blochbauer died, didn't make the claim. It was his heirs. They got swindled. Same thing happened here. The Dutch kept 200 paintings. Um, two weeks after the decision in the Altman case in 2006, the Dutch gave back 198 paintings to this family. 
but not these two. Why? Because they had sold these two in 1960s to a Count Stroganov, who claimed erroneously that they had been taken by the communists from his family, long story. Uh, and then he sold them to Norton Simon, the industrialist who left them to the museum in Pasadena. So these are 100% stolen paintings. Once uh, taken by Goering, they were found, I think, by the monuments men, as uh, Stuart Eisenstadt mentioned in, in the Munich art collecting point, given back to Holland, not given back to the family. Um, so there was a court case here in the United States where the family sued the Norton Simon Museum. It went on and on and on, and they lost. They lost uh, based on one argument only, um, was something called the Act of State Doctrine, which says that a US court can decide not to judge the actions of another country. Okay. And so these paintings are still here in Southern California. And it, it upsets me very much. Um, and, and I think it's one of the deficiencies, if I, I don't want to be too critical of, of Stuart Eisenstadt, but he's, he's a, acting sometimes as a government official and they, they don't like to talk about specifics. Okay, But I think it's really not good form for the United States to be hectoring other countries about restitution when we have two paintings stolen by Hermann Goering that are on display in Pasadena have never been returned to that family. Uh, and there, there are other cases like this. Uh, so there's a lot of difficulty in bringing these cases. Uh, likelihood, if we had stayed in the US court system, we could have easily lost on a number of different issues in the Klimt case. It was only because the Austrians ultimately agreed to arbitration after the embarrassment of losing in the Supreme Court that we were able to win that case, but uh, ordinarily it doesn't end so well. Here's another one in Austria that's not returned. Um, Hitler bought this painting from a uh, non-Jewish count, but his wife was a little bit Jewish and um, should be returned. It's a very famous Vermeer painting, it's, uh, but they decided not to, uh, not to take it because they said uh, the wife wasn't persecuted enough by the Nazis, so she was attacked in, the Nazi newspaper Stormer, and um, her kids were taken away from her, but that was not quite enough to, uh, to say that her family was threatened when this painting was bought by Hitler for a reduced price from, anyway, it's an outrage. Um, this is a success story. Uh, Maria Altman's brother-in-law was a, a sweater manufacturer, had a very large collection. He fled like Ferdinand Blochbauer in March of 1938 from Vienna. His entire collection was auctioned off with a published catalog in June 38. So they had an auction in his house with a published catalog with pictures of the paintings four months after the Anschluss. That shows you how, how quickly these things happened. Um, this painting was found in Strasbourg in the museum and the museum decided to, uh, to buy the painting. They had bought the painting unknowingly, uh, not knowing its provenance. And when this came out, to their credit, uh, the, the museum in Strasbourg decided to buy it again. And so they negotiated a, a price and purchased it a second time from the family in order to keep it. Uh, so different from the, the Getty that got it for free donated, um, the museum actually bought it twice, which is something the Getty probably should have done. Uh, this is a painting that was found in a collection in Chicago. The, the plaintiff came to me. It was a long, involved case that went up to the California Supreme Court and ended up uh, resolving after the US government came in and seized the painting as stolen property taken across state lines after we filed our lawsuit uh, and the case ultimately settled. Um, very difficult cases. Whoops, I think that's it. That's, that's the end. So if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them or we can go on to the, the next speaker. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. Professor Basler has a question. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> so I could have used one of these. Or not good. Okay. Thank you, first of all, Randy, for coming here and, and giving this presentation. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, do you think that the arbitrators in that second case decided against you because there was, if there was blowback from that first 
case. I mean, they basically, you know, said that these very precious paintings need to be, don't belong in the Belva del Gary. Well, I, so I, I think there was um, pressure on the arbitrators after the first decision. They had presumed that the Austrian government would decide to buy the, at least the gold portrait, the famous gold portrait of Adela Blochbauer. There was, in the arbitration agreement, they had the right to purchase. It was, there was a whole procedure of establishing the price. But the minister, uh, after the decision, I think she was caught off guard a little bit, and she uh, mistakenly, in a press conference, said, we don't have money in our budget for this. And once she used the word budget, it was over, right? Because as soon as you're weighing culture versus healthcare, police, right, army, the other things that, that take money from the government, um, culture is going to lose, right? What they should have said was, uh, we have to either give up this asset or some other asset, right? The Austrian government has lots of assets and uh, they have forests and stock and, and all sorts of things. So they could have decided it that way. But as soon as she said it was going to be a budget issue, I knew it was over and they, they decided not to purchase it. So the arbitrators were, were then feeling bad because they thought the Austrian government would sort of step up to the plate and, and buy this and keep it in Austria. And I, so I do think that influenced them. The, the decision that they made was that the new restitution law that was passed in 1998, okay, did not incorporate all the old restitution laws from 1948, okay, which in the ones in 1948 reversed the burden of proof. So in after 48, you didn't, as a Jewish family, have to prove what the thief did with your property after you fled the country, or if you were killed, what had happened, right? The burden was on the purchaser to show that they got it legally in good faith without any persecution, which was nearly impossible. Um, so I was never concerned with this painting. I mean, I was looking at emails to prepare for this yesterday. That that last painting, I thought, was the only one that I was sure to get back because there was no issue. It was hanging on the wall in 1939 in his house when he's already gone. What fact could you learn that would allow that not to be returned? Uh, but they came up with one, which was, they said, well, it's uncertain what happened to it. You haven't proved that it was stolen, which wasn't a requirement under the restitution laws. And they said those weren't incorporated into the new restitution law. The same committee that, remember, the Austrians set up this committee to decide they had already rejected this twice on that ground. Um, in a subsequent case, they changed their mind, not on this painting, but on in another case, they said, oh, no, you don't have to prove what the Nazis did with it, we're going to presume, just like the old old laws. And I've been trying for almost 20 years now to get them to reconsider. And and there's a, a now a Jewish member of that committee, uh, a retired Supreme Court judge in Austria, and he refuses to let them reconsider it. He says it's decided, can't be undone, which is not true, by the way. But he's uh, uh, he's an impediment. So sometimes you have people who are an impediment to um, what Stuart Eisenstadt calls just and fair solutions. Um, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, tough situation. I, I'm not a big fan of the resolutions um, and Washington principles and all those because I think people think that they mean more than they do. Uh, when push comes to shove, it's really about the individuals involved and whether they have uh, a desire or a reason to do the right thing. A lot of times you're dealing with politicians, um, employees of government agencies, and those people react differently than people who are playing with their own money. Uh, and you have to you have to hit them different ways. So it's publicity, votes, um, reputation, right, press. Those type of things are what matters to a uh, a bureaucrat who's making a decision or a politician who's making a decision. Uh, it's not not the same as dealing with uh, an individual who's who's dealing with something that used to be on their wall or dealing with their own money. Um, so anyway, that's it's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I, I really hope that um, that there's more research done uh, in the Armenian community on uh, possessions. I know it's it's a long time ago now. It's a generation further than what we have to deal with in, in the Holocaust. 
Uh, but uh, if it can be done, and if the artworks are in the right location where the law is uh, in favorable, it can be accomplished. Uh, I don't want to be um, too optimistic, though, because you can see in cases like this, these paintings in the Norton Simon Museum, that even if you found a looted painting in California in a private museum, you might have quite a, a, a difficulty recovering it. So thank you very much again for inviting me today. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Mr. Schoenberg, for that truly captivating presentation. Our next speaker, Lauren Fielder, serves as Assistant Dean for Graduate and International Programs at the University of Texas School of Law, where she additionally serves as the Director of the School's Institute for Transnational Law. She also teaches courses on international and constitutional law and is the author of numerous articles and book chapters on African law and policy and restitution of art and cultural property, among other topics. Please help me welcome Dean Fielder. You mean have the clicker? Oh, right there. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the organizers who have invited me to be here today. I'd also like to thank my research assistant at the Institute of Transnational Law, Major Brian Jack, United States Army Judge Advocate, who is working with me to carry this project further and turn it into a paper. It's really my honor to be here today with people who have inspired me for a very long time. So I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this conversation. I'm going to be talking about Ukraine today, and we're going to take what, what we're learning here and open the scope a little bit, because I think that this project has so many important implications, not just for, for the Armenian genocide and getting those treasures back into the hands where they should be, but also in broadening this model that was created in the context of the Holocaust restitution and we are taking that and putting it onto the Armenian genocide, but we can now use it for getting artwork and cultural property back in conflicts that we're having now and in the future. So I'll be talking about, I will be talking about Ukraine. All right, so here's what we're gonna do today. I'm going to talk about a little bit of give a brief overview of the international laws of war related to art and cultural property and conflict situations um, while i'm going to then talk about the theft and destruction of ukraine's cultural heritage happening now and then we're going to take those two things and put them together and we'll see this big disconnect between what the legal overlay is and what the reality is on the protection of art and cultural property. Um, then we're just gonna talk about enforcement and restitution and why restitution is such an important thing in these situations. And then I wanna end on a very briefly, wanna end on a happy note because these are very hard things to talk about. So I wanna just show you a little bit about the response of Ukrainian artists because a big part, all of us in this room probably love art and cultural objects, right? And so artists are responding to the conflict right now so i'm just going to share some of the art that's coming out of the conflict okay so let's just start briefly and talk about the historical significance that we have here so our colleagues have done such important work right here to push the law forward as i said we've had the holocaust restitution work that's been done by um people, including Mr. Schoenberg, who we just heard speak, so important. And the big project here of this group is to take that model and put it onto this other genocide now that we need to deal with. So um, we, we know the Holocaust was the biggest, the biggest theft, we've heard this today, the biggest theft of art and cultural property of all time. 
we're learning a lot about the Armenian genocide here with this group's work. And we're just beginning to learn the scope of all of the things that were taken in the context of that genocide. So that is the project that our, st our students are doing, working on cataloging these things so we can take the next steps. And then we see how Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, is, is, is following along in the same vein. So Ukraine's Ministry of Culture has said recently that it estimates that over 480,000 works of art have already been looted during the invasions and the occupation. And that doesn't even include the thousands and thousands of works that have also been destroyed just because of the, because of the war and the conflict. So now I'd like to just go through a brief overview of what are the laws of war. So there is a lot of international law that could apply to these situations, but I'm going to specifically just talk about humanitarian law. So humanitarian law is the law of war. Um, the larger project that this talk is a small part of is looking at the laws of war and assessing where there are gaps and using the war in Ukraine and the theft and destruction of art and cultural property to expose some of those gaps. So um, I would just like to take a little walk through history and talk about the progression um, from the earliest time that we know about laws of war all the way to where we are today. I promise I won't take very long. We could talk about this for hours and hours, but I won't. Um, I just wanted to show you first, this is a passage from the Bible, from the book of Deuteronomy. And it talks about, you know, what we, what the, for most of history, the rule was is to the victor go the spoils. So you see that here. And then you see these horses, um, the horses of St. Mark. So the horses of St. Mark, we think, we're not sure, we think these horses were created in ancient Greece. They, we know for sure they went to Constantinople and they were displayed at the Hippodrome during the Fourth Crusades. Um, Venetians came and stole the horses and took them to Venice. And then when Napoleon came in and invaded Venice, Napoleon took the horses and took them to Paris. And then in the aftermath of Napoleon's wars, and finally we started getting these ideas about um, that it was right to give art and cultural property back to the, to the people it belonged to. Well, it went back to Venice. So that's where they are today. So the very famous horses that have had this journey. Um, and then there's one I always like to talk about. So. Um, when we know that throughout history, we've had this idea that the victors get the spoils, there have always though been some people talking about how maybe this should be tempered by other considerations. And so Cicero um, writing, well, in prosecuting this really bad actor called Gaius Verus, I think this is one of the most interesting old um, cases about art looting. So this awful guy, Gaius Verus, he was, um, he was governor of Sicily and he did these terrible things. He was just known for being this outrageous art looter and just bad person. And so he did really big things like stealing pieces of art and cultural property from churches. But he also just did little weird things like stealing silverware from people's houses that he'd go and be invited to eat at. And so it was during a time that it was okay to take things, take art and cultural property. For example, if you won a war or something like that, but what he did is that he used these things that he stole for his own private benefit. And so he was prosecuted by Cicero. And Cicero said, you know, it's okay to take art and cultural property, but you can't use it for yourself. You have to use it for some public use, right? So he was prosecuted. But across time, we have this very big acceptance for stealing art and cultural property in the context of a conflict. But you know, that began to change. So um, in the 16th to 18th century, legal scholars were talking about this concept of a just war. And in the context of making all these rules for what a just war should include, people started talking about the fact that art and cultural property were things that were not, you know, they were for public they shouldn't be taken by armies. They shouldn't be taken by invading armies. And so these ideas were discussed more. And then we come to the point where we have a very interesting man, Francis Lieber. He was Prussian. Francis Lieber was fought in two wars. One, the first one was um, Napoleon's invasion. He was a teenager left for dead on a battlefield. 
um, somehow survived, fought in another war, made his way to the United States, where he became a professor at Columbia College. And he became a real expert on laws of war. So when the Civil War happened in the United States, Abraham Lincoln went to him and had him help develop a set of rules for the United States Army during the Civil War. So he created what we know now as the Lieber Code. And this was a set of rules for what the Army could do. And it included protection of cultural property and art. And that was used in the United States Civil War. But it became very popular as a set of ideas that um, European countries wanted to model. And so it made it, those ideas made their way to Europe. And we had then the first big international treaty that covered uh, or included protection for art and cultural property. And that was the Hague Convention of 1899. It was quickly followed up by the Hague Convention of 1907. And the 1907 Hague Convention, both of those, by the way, were really broad treaties about war. It, they weren't treaties just about art and cultural property, but art and cultural property were included in those treaties. So um, two, two provisions I'll point out that are important for us and what we're talking about today. Article 27 said attacker needed to avoid harm to buildings dedicated to art, science, hospitals um, for as long as possible. And Article 56 said that we must treat art and cultural property as private property and seizure is forbidden. So that was really important. And those two treaties and those rules that I just described were the rules that were in place in, those were the rules that were in place in um, World War I and World War II. So um, we have the Armenian genocide here. Also were in place there, but there, you know, that these treaties are focused more on international conflicts. And what's, so when we have um, in World War II, the Nazis stripped Jewish people of their citizenship in a way that wasn't, the Ottomans didn't do that to the extent of the Nazis. But anyway, just to let you know what the, what the legal overlay was during these, this time period. So, um, we have so but what do we have we have here this very famous painting i'm sure you've all seen of the nazis stealing artwork they um they and this is what happened under the framework of these treaties so obviously it did not work so that brings us to this huge change in international law so international law shifted radically in the aftermath of World War II. So we can say there was a sea change in human rights law, humanitarian law changed as well. Lots and lots and lots of treaties were created. And so we had a Hague Convention of 1954 and the Hague Convention of 1954, um, the 1954 Hague Convention was a treaty that was devoted specifically to art and cultural property. So that was a big change. It also was more detailed and defined and defined an approach to the protection of cultural property in, in, a, in a more protective way. Um, in the first protocol, so that was a follow-up to the treaty. And by the way, Russia and Ukraine have both signed this treaty and the first protocol. Um, it prohibited export of property, of art and cultural property that recovered from occupied territories. Um, and it really emphasized the importance of the return of art and cultural property that was taken or moved during a war. So we have this really robust set of laws now that protects art and cultural property. So now I just want to talk about Ukraine. Um, I, I think we're, we're a little bit behind on time, so I'm going to move through this a little bit faster than I planned to, but, but I want to talk about it a little bit. So um, I want us to look at what's happening in Ukraine, and we'll put that against the backdrop of the laws that I just described. So I want to talk briefly about some uh, really notable losses. So in Crimea to 2014, you know, we're, we're, we're now almost 10 years from that invasion. We're almost two years from the second invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, and as we approach these anniversaries, as I told you before, 
Um, the Ukraine Ministry of Culture estimates that around 480,000 pieces have been looted, thousands and thousands more have been damaged. We don't know the extent of how much has been looted and how much has been damaged because it's an ongoing conflict. And also many of Ukraine's catalogs were not digitized. They were on paper and they have been stolen and destroyed as well during this, during this war. Um, all right, so two things that I really wanna talk about is that we have some looting and destruction that's tied to where the conflict actually is. And then I wanna talk about how Putin is targeting as well, um, Putin is targeting as well um, Ukrainian culture, even in places where, excuse me, even in places where the fighting isn't happening. Okay, so Crimea. I'm gonna show you some pieces of art that are, um, that have been looted. If you're interested, I was going to talk more about the pieces of art, but if you're interested in these, let me know and I'll tell you who the artist was and, and um, tell you about these. Um, all right, inside Kherson, in, in this region of Ukraine, Russia has plundered an estimated 15,000 exhibits from dozens of institutions. The lost cultural items also include ancient Scythian gold jewelry and other pieces, um, and some very important first edition texts. Um, the only, in, in some of these museums, the only pieces that were not looted were because the, the looters didn't have ladders to reach high pieces. And so in all of these in, in all of these examples of Russia looting, you can see that it's a really organized thing because people come in, they come in with trucks, they'll have someone that looks like an expert, they know exactly what they're going and getting, and they're taking these things. So in Mariupol, um, three separate museums were systematically plundered by Russian forces. Over 2,000 unique exhibits were taken from these museums, including um, some very famous paintings from Russian artists. They also took several ancient icons, including the Gospel of 1811 from the Venetian printing house for the Greeks of Mariupol. Um, and more than 200 important military medals. In Melitopol, um, we have a lot of looting of these Scythian gold pieces. So we have the jewelry, we have the helmet. There are many pieces that have been taken, very, very valuable. Um, we know some of these have already been found in Spain, so looted, moved to Spain. They were, they were, the, the thieves tried to sell them um, in Madrid. So the Spanish police recovered these items, in part because the thing that was just covered up was because um, there's been a lot of publicity around some of the more famous pieces that might be going missing. But we know that as of July 2023, 148 museums and 125 libraries have been looted, damaged, or destroyed. So this is an interesting side note. Some of these gold pieces that were loaned to a museum, a Dutch museum, before the Russian invasion 10 years ago, um, when it was time to give those pieces back, the museum had to decide whether to give them back to Russia or give them back to Ukraine. Both Ukraine and Russia were claiming those pieces, demanding the returns, and the Dutch Museum went through a big process to think what is the right thing to do and gave the pieces back to Ukraine. So the, Smith sorry, the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative is very active right now in Ukraine and trying to document what's going on. Documenting what's happening, of course, is very important for what will happen next, including any kind of criminal prosecutions, including restitution efforts. So they're, it's very interesting. They're using technology to try to figure out what's going on as it's happening. 
They're using thermal imaging so they can figure out whether there are fires that are that are probably caused by bombs and not something like a forest fire. They're using satellite images. They're analyzing news reports. They are also um, having, they are also talking to experts who are in Ukraine and are observing what's happening. And so on this map, the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative report is showing you areas where um, it's, there's been particularly a lot of looting or damage. And they've put out this, this is as of July of last year, it gives you a count of what they think have, has been the level of destruction um, in these different types of cultural art and cultural property categories. So we can see that these things have been looted or destroyed where the fighting is happening. That's what these maps show. But this is a much more widespread problem than just um, art that's, that's a let's say, a, a casualty of war um, as it would be in any situation. So we know that Putin has been very, very vocal about about his opinion that Ukrainian culture should be erased. So this is something that we've seen across everything we've heard today. Um, we've seen these examples of erasing culture. Part of that is stealing art and destroying art. But we've also seen we've also seen the kidnapping of Ukrainian children. These Ukrainian children have been taken into Russia. They've been re-educated. Some of them, older children, have been sent to be educated um, by the Russian military. We've seen Russia not allowing people to speak the Ukrainian language. Um, so many things are this are are very similar to what we've what we've been seeing. But I have a few places where Putin has made these speeches talking about how Ukrainians, there is really no Ukrainian identity. They're all just Russians. And so we can understand why um, if Putin feels this way, there would be such a targeted push to destroy or steal um, Ukrainian heritage. Another thing that's happened, we heard about misattribution by an earlier speaker. That was very, very interesting because one of the things that Russia has done is um, attribute, for example, in museums, Ukrainian artists' work, it will say Russian. Um, early in the war, this is very sad, this was definitely a targeted destruction of art. Um, this artist is Maria Primachenko. She was a very famous Russian folk artist. Um, she inspired Marc Chagall. He was inspired by her work. Um, Pablo Picasso was a fan of this work. It's got very important cultural themes um, to Ukraine. In the this picture, the green one, this was a man who who, who he, he was he was jailed for talking about his that he was Ukrainian. So Russia imprisoned him for claiming to be Ukrainian. And he's and it's a it's a folk now a folk tale about how he said he just wanted to come back and die die and be buried in Ukrainian soil. So this was one of her paintings that she made to to celebrate him and his his journey and his struggle. And early in the conflict that happened two years ago, um, Russia bombed this little museum. And there was no fighting, there was no fighting around it. There were no targets around it. It was just targeted because of what art it contained. Um, there was a man who was running in and out of the museum trying to bring these pieces of art out to save them. And one quote I heard about this man who was trying to save the art, of course, is very dangerous to be running in and out of a burning building. Someone said that um, someone said that you it's you must risk your life to save eternity, and I think that really encapsulates what we're talking about here. How it's culture is so important. It is something that is eternal, and we have we've we've seen it, for example, in Monuments Men, people giving up their lives to try to save these important cultural objects and pieces of art, because it is so important to the identity of a people. And that's what's so important about the project that you all are doing here. OK, so the disconnect. Of course, this is the theater that was bombed. There were many hundreds of people that died there. They were sheltering there. They were children. 
it was marked saying children, you know, and it was still bombed by Russia. Um, but we talked about this international law that exists. And so the problem is, how can we have this international law that's supposed to protect against this? And we're seeing it again. We saw it done to Armenian people. We saw it done to Jewish people. We've seen it after that, and we're seeing it now. How is it that we have the law? So if I just told you about the law, you might think, oh, this is great. So now what happened in the past can't happen in the present. But we have this problem of enforcement in international law. When I'm teaching international law or I'm teaching human rights, I think the hardest thing for my students to understand, and I have to say it over and over again, is yes, international law is real, it exists, but there's always this big problem of enforcement. So it feels really different than our domestic law where we know, okay, here's what the law is. If the law is broken, here's the consequence. With international law, especially our modern international law that took off after World War II, is still in its infancy. So we have this problem of lack of enforcement. With the Hague Convention of 1954, the law itself does not provide an enforcement mechanism. So, you know, what's going on? Why is this that way? Enforcement relies on more practical things. So if we think about the UN Security Council, if we think about the P5 veto, and we think about who the members of the, who the permanent members of the Security Council are, for example, the United States, Russia are two of them. So we leave a lot of these things, the enforcement part of ensuring international peace and security to the Security Council. They have the final say in the United Nations. And for me, you know, I've always seen that the United Nations doesn't work very well, but the war in Ukraine really was this turning point in my mind about just how dysfunctional it is. We have, we can come up with a hundred examples of how the United Nations can be dysfunctional. Now there's some very good things that have come from the United Nations, for example, supporting treaties and, you know, supporting the negotiation of them, having a platform for the birth of these treaties. But actually, when it comes down to it, we've left the last stop for enforcement to an organization that, you know, is, hand, is, is, is completely dysfunctional because of the P5 veto system. Even when we take things to international tribunals, what happens if someone doesn't follow the rules of an international tribunal? It can go back to the United, the United Nations Security Council. So we definitely have this problem, and that doesn't mean that it isn't great that we have this progression of international law, that we have these treaties. It's we're moving, all of these things together are moving, um, moving us forward to the place we should be. But I think this, the message is that we're just pretty, we're just newly on the journey. So what can we do? And I think that's where restitution comes in. And I really think that this project the Armenian Genocide Project is such a huge, hugely important thing because restitution is always going to be important. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we need to have, when we have a system that doesn't have perfect solutions, I want to call it the toolbox approach. We have to use every tool we, we can. And restitution is a really important tool that we have. So what are these humanitarian laws designed to do? They're designed to prevent and then we have international criminal law that we really don't have time to talk about today, but that's designed to punish. And with prevention and punishment, we hope we have deterrence, but we also need the restitution piece. You don't need me to tell you again how important it is to get these pieces of art and cultural property back into the hands of the people that they belong to for that justice, for that healing, right? But when we say, okay, it happened in the Holocaust and now we're bringing it to the Armenian genocide, we're building this, we're building things up. It takes on a life of its own. It will snowball and it becomes something that we can use and apply in the future. The other thing about restitution is, even if we say, well, we've got Russia and Russia is gonna block you know, anything the Security Council will do now. We can think about the fact that just like I showed you the Scythian gold jewelry that has gone to Spain, looted art makes its way to other places and restitution is a powerful tool there. And then if we really wanna think positively, we can think Putin will not always be the leader in Russia. And we hope in the future that we'll have a more 
cooperative regime in Russia where we could seek restitution. Now, that's a positive outlook. The negative side of that is it could be very far in the future, but we know this restitution project that everyone's been working on where we've looked back We've looked back to the 30s and 40s. Now we're looking back to 1915 and 16 with this project. So we're building a model that not only looks back, but it can look far into the future. So now I told you I would leave you with something less depressing than the things I've talked about so far. I just wanted to show, again, some responses of Ukrainian artists. This is, this is one, this is a group of artists in Herson, an artist group that they, they, they were so, you know, they were occupied and they were, it was so horrible for them, they decided a way to deal with it psychologically would be to make this group where they could make art together. So this piece of art is called Impossible to Stay, but Leave. These are very interesting. They're ammunition boxes. So this is a husband and wife artist team that paints these beautiful icons on ammunition boxes. So we're also seeing street art that depicts, you know, the struggle and the triumph of the Ukrainian people. This is an artist called C15. The last, the last slide that you see will also have this artist. And this is interesting. This is a, um, a musician, Ukrainian musician, and she performed as a as performative a piece of performative art. She performed the song "The Starry Night." in um, in a bunker when you know during a bombing Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Fielder, for shedding light on the Ukrainian layer of this conference and this topic. Uh, next, we will hear from two of the main organizers of this conference, Michael Baszler and Hegnard Wattenpau. Uh, Michael Baszler is a professor of law and the 1939 law scholar in Holocaust and Human Rights Studies at Chapman University. Hegnad Wattenpau is a professor of art history at UC Davis. Please help me in welcoming professors Baszler and Wattenpau. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our friends on Zoom for being a part of this. And thank you, Nanor and Hasmik, for the incredible behind the scenes job. You make this look very easy. Um, can we have, I don't know how to use, can we have the next slide? Um, I want to acknowledge the Fowler Museum where we are right now. Uh, on Monday, the Fowler Museum made headlines when it initiated the repatriation of Ashante African objects that have resided in its collection since 1965. It was a proactive step. No claims had been made to the Fowler. The Fowler took the step forward. Uh, it's very unusual. It's very welcome. And it really shows how much the needle has moved in the issue of repatriation and museum ethics restitution of various kinds so change does happen it's incredibly inspiring um, as you have already heard our project came about as a result of last year's conference 
uh, where we had a clear mandate from Ambassador Eisenstadt about the critical importance of research and fact-finding as a base for any kind of restitution process. Professor Tanerak Cham, Professor Michael Basler, and myself determined that our research project would have to have a unique and innovative design. It could not simply be a project in art history or legal studies or genocide studies. It had to be multidisciplinary and collaborative. We had to leverage the experience and creativity of all of us, and we had to leverage the tools of today, including data science and digital humanities. With a small grant from our friends at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, thank you, um, and the support of the staff at the Promise Armenian Institute's Armenian Genocide Research Project, we recruited a group of researchers who were students in law, art history, Armenian studies, data science, archaeology, and we began our work over the summer. It was an incredible experience for all of us. Pedagogy was always a central concern of ours. The co-directors co of Agla RP, as we were called, we are all academics. Research is an integral part of teaching, and teaching is an integral part of research. One of our goals was to train a group of students, young scholars and baby lawyers, in the importance of restitution issues and in the methods for research and legal thinking around these issues. We began our summer with an orientation and training session. I think the professors learned as much as the students. We had group meetings and individual meetings with each researcher. They benefited from ongoing training, follow-up, supervision, sometimes corrections. The material we worked with is complicated and it's very easy to overlook something or to make an error. Our initial goal was to use the methods of provenance research in art history to create an inventory of Armenian art in major collections and to flag those works whose provenance raised questions as to whether they had entered the art market as a result of the Armenian genocide. Uh, and here I want to introduce the art historical technical term provenance. And can I have the next slide, please? One more. Um, and one more. Um, so provenance is a type of record, um, a chronological list of the successive owners of a work of art and the manner of its transfer among them. Provenance communicates the itinerary's object's trace as they are sold, inherited, or gifted. This is a gospel book located today at the Freer Gallery of Art at the Smithsonian Institution. This manuscript was written and illustrated by Mikhail, son of Bahram, that's how he identifies himself, around 1669-70 in a town called Noravan in Sivas, or uh, near Sivas, or Sebastia. We know that the manuscript remained in Noravan until 1915, and we know what happened to the Armenians of Sivas province in 1915. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, this, uh, this gospel reappeared after 1915 in the possession of one Hagop Kevorkian, who is often described as powerful and mysterious. He was a major art dealer in Paris and New York. We've come to know several of these dealers very closely in our research group. The Freer purchased the gospel from him in 1936. What you're seeing on the screen is the current provenance for this object on the Freer website. It's very short. I think we can agree that there are some silences here. Nothing is said about this manuscript from its creation in the late 17th century until 1936, especially the critical years of 1915 to 1936. One could rewrite this provenance to account for all of the episodes of the life of this manuscript, but for each episode, we would need documentation, archives, inventories, news items, art dealers, ledgers, private letters. It takes the skills and perseverance of a detective to reconstruct the full provenance, and sometimes we can't. A challenge for provenance research is that there is a tremendous unevenness in the availability and quality of the information. Can I ask you to go back to the slide of the one more? One more. Yes, this one. Thank you. Um, 
the so the pro, uh, the ch challenge is the tremendous unevenness in the availability and quality of information. Most of the available research tools and guides for provenance research are helpful when researching European and American art and areas such as Nazi looted art. You're looking at a photograph of Rose Vallant, who was a French curator in Paris um, during the Nazi occupation, and she managed to keep a secret diary recording Nazi thefts. So for um, Holocaust looted art, we have resources such as this that are now available and accessible and they've been digitized. Um, for areas of art history that are relatively less well researched, such as Southeast Asian art or African art, and including Armenian art, the resources we have are far, far fewer. So our initial task for AGLA RP was project design, figuring out where the right information is, how to access it, how to translate it for our needs. It requires a great deal of knowledge, experience, and imagination. But we did not start totally from scratch. Can we go forward a few slides? Uh, one more. Thank you. Um, and here I want to acknowledge the long tradition of scholarship on Armenian art and the important work of activists and scholars who began to document the destruction of Armenian art while the genocide was still ongoing. Some of their works are better known than others, and some of their research was never published, is completely forgotten, and it sits in archives gathering dust for about a century. One of our most important tools was the research of the late professor Avedi Sanjian, who was professor of Armenian studies at UCLA for many years. I'm sure many people in this audience knew him, and I was honored to meet him when I was an undergraduate. Professor Sanjian created this catalog of Armenian manuscripts in the United States in the year 1976. Obviously, that was some time ago. Uh, in addition to the published catalog, however, we also had the benefit of Professor Sanjian's archive, his papers that are preserved at UCLA Special Collections. One of our team members, Nairi Artunians, who I don't think is here in person, but maybe is on Zoom, spent many fruitful hours in the Sanjian archive. Our research team also used the work of Professor Bernard Cooley, who is based in Europe and who has compiled a world catalog of Armenian manuscripts published in 2020. These were invaluable. We had to adapt to these existing materials that were compiled for specific purposes by specific um, scholars to our needs and our project's needs and our methods. We also had to check every item, update our information using digital tools. And here I want to acknowledge Vem Nazarian, a member of our team. I don't know if he's here or if he's on Zoom. He specializes in data science and he helped us understand how computers can talk to each other to generate inventories. Actually, he didn't, I, I didn't understand, but uh, the other team members understood what he was saying. Uh, to organize our materials, we had to create a, a special database with categories adapted to our needs. Uh, Angie Sapanovich, who is here, and some of the other students were experts at creating databases. They identified the categories of information we needed, and they broke them down to even smaller categories. This was an iterative process. We went through a number of versions of our database, and we're still tinkering with it. We started with relatively low-hanging fruit. Um, in law, the United States is divided into circuit courts or regions. The researchers were each assigned a circuit. They searched for Armenian art in public access records and online catalogs. What's important about this comprehensive approach is that we also needed to know if there were institutions where there was no Armenian art. For example, the researcher who was assigned Guam, not surprisingly, they concluded that there were no materials there that fit art criteria. So even though this is negative research, we had to uh, do this so that you know, we have a comprehensive idea of what there is and what there is not. We were able to complete the survey of online catalogs almost completely. 
there was only the this was only the first step because once we've compiled this original inventory, we have to um, verify all every information. And digital catalogs of collections are extremely uneven. Some institutions have put a lot of very good information online for researchers, but other institutions have very basic information uh, and sometimes inaccurate information. Different institutions use different catalogs, different search engines, different software, and some are easier to use than others. Sometimes the record of an object is incomplete, it may be inaccurate, or it may be problematic. But even something that is inaccurate tells us something about this object and about its trajectory. One of the challenges is that it's not always obvious how to search for what we would consider Armenian art. Not all museums call it that. So we developed a list of search criteria that ranged from geographical des designations, Turkey, Caucasus, Anatolia, Iran, uh, to dynastic criteria, Byzantine, Seljuk, etc. Sometimes Armenian art is cataloged under another identifying term, Byzantine, early Christian, oftentimes Turkish, sometimes Russian, as in the case of uh, paintings by Ibozovsky, the um, Armenian painter in the Russian Empire in the 19th century. We also experimented with different research methods. You're going to hear from some of them uh, in a moment from the researchers. For example, Dikran Khodanyan was tasked with researching eyewitness statements on video of genocide survivors in oral history interviews in order to identify descriptions of theft, looting, sacking of churches, and other uh, repositories. Another strategy was to identify relevant archives of the individuals who were involved in the sale and collection of Armenian art art dealers, collectors, and curators. You will hear later today from Ani Parnagyan, who tackled a very important and very difficult, I think, archive. Through this work, we began the process of identifying and beginning to map a network of what Michael calls a cast of characters. These characters run the gamut from archeologists, scholars, curators, art historians, museum professionals, amateur, collectors, art lovers, middlemen, fixers, shady characters, and savory and some very unsavory characters. An important realization was the fact that for a number of reasons, much of the existing research about Armenian art is focused on one specific type of Armenian art, which is religious manuscripts and religious art in general. Uh, and I can talk about why this is. There are some very specific reasons for that. But there are many other important types of objects of Armenian art or material culture, valuables, including modern art created by Ottoman Armenian artists in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, they, they range from things like uh, textiles, carpets, um, including religious textiles such as um, uh, altar curtains, modern painting, uh, but we do not have the same kind of research that is focused on these kinds of objects. So it's an even greater challenge to inventory these materials. Uh, in our group, we flag this area as um, an area of future research. Uh, another area of research that some of the students worked on was to identify major private collections. These are more difficult to research because unlike public collections who often publish catalogs of their holdings, some more detailed than others, or announce if they um, purchase something, a private collection is the possession of a private individual who is under no obligation to publicize them or inform anyone about them. They rarely have online catalogs. So this is more challenging work. We began the process of identifying major private collections of Armenian art in the past or in the present. We identified a few collections that had existed once but were later dispersed. So we began the process of tracking the movement of these objects. Uh, one potential future project that remains for some of these collections 
uh, that's particularly important is to figure out where and when these collections were dispersed and sold and where these materials ended up. Uh, can we go further? So future outputs. Um, some of our research is going to result in publications of different kinds. Um, a few steps ahead, my dream is that we would one day be able to create something similar to major digital projects, such as Virtual Benin, which is what you see here. And if you could go one further, one more slide. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Jewish Digital Cultural Recovery Project. Uh, which is another digital archive that um, has a lot of materials in very accessible digitized ways. You can do provenance research, you can read secondary research, you can track specific objects, you can learn about specific collections. I mean, these projects are incredible. Uh, they have taken enormous time, effort, and um, a lot of expense to to complete them. Digital Benin is uh, funded in part by a German foundation, and this is millions of dollars. But they are amazing, uh, amazing projects. So that's sort of uh, in the future. Michael, Taner, and I were incredibly impressed with the commitment and creativity of our researchers. They are on their way to becoming experts in this kind of research, and to really appreciate the implications for, of this research for the history of the Armenian genocide, for art history, for human rights, for decolonizing the art world from all kinds of perspectives. And this is just the beginning. We have work to do. Thank you. I just want to say welcome everybody that you're here. This has been an amazing um, adventure for me. Um, working with my colleagues, Tanner and, and Hagnar has been just an incredible experience. And part of that experience that made it so special is to be able to work with the students. Um, and that's why we wanted to make sure at this particular conference that as we report to you, we can have the students be speakers here, and that's coming up, and they will tell you exactly what kind of work they did over the summer in um, finding uh, Armenian cultural objects as a first step. And you know, every museum in the United States, including we now know there are no Armenian art objects in Guam, but if there was one, we would have found one. So. It's a it really categorization is such an important step. And students both in law and in art are very good in, in doing that. One of the, when we finished the interview or the presentation that um, Ambassador Isaacs had met, um, the three of us had a Q&A discussion with him. And one was just kind of tell, you know, ask him a couple of things. And one of the, the things that he said is, and we talked about the fact, and I said with pride, about how the, the students are doing provenance research. And as soon as I said that, uh, he went back and said, no, 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 this is too complicated. You really need somebody that's trained to go ahead and do that. And I can tell you from my experience working with law students, they can be easily trained. Right? And uh, the, the kind of skills that they learn as law students can easily translate into the kind of meticulous work that Ambassador Isis, that who himself is a lawyer, knows it needs to be done. And we feel just very grateful that we put out the call this summer to students, not just at Chapman or UCLA, USC, Loyola, other places. We ended up students you know, coming to us and saying, yes, we want to do that. And it was amazing uh, how devoted they were. Some of the students spent part of the time in Armenia. And so uh, they would reach out to us, what, what can I do now that I'm in Armenia? There was a student that was visiting um, in Jerusalem, said, I'm going to the Armenian quarter um, you know, in Jerusalem. What else can I do? Can I talk to the priests over there? Maybe they have some objects. So that type of devotion that we have just makes us 
so inspired that even though this is a long road, it, we can see this, but how important it is, and that's the generation after generation um, can go and continue with that. Because these objects, like unlike human beings, they don't die, they don't disappear. And as Hegnar said, there's a provenance, a chain of title, chain of possession that um, you can trace. Uh, I was involved as part of the litigation team in the, um, the, law, the lawsuit that we file against um, the Getty. And it really began with a meeting, a meeting with the Getty, with myself and Varkas Yagayan, who you saw, the hero and really the patron uh, of this project, the late Varkas. And we went and met with the director of the Getty Museum and their lawyers. And they were polite to us, but it was really like, go away. We, we, this is, we're not going to talk to you. And so we had no choice but to go ahead and, you know, what we do in America, what lawyers do in America, is file a lawsuit um, in court. And we filed it in California State Court. And when we had the various hearings in the lawsuit, we had um, Armenians, you know, their you know, elderly men and women, uh, women in their babushkas, stand in the courtroom as we were arguing to the judge why this lawsuit of the, you know, the Western prelacy against Getty should not be dismissed. And I remember our lead uh, counsel, Lee Boyd, who you saw, at one point turned and said to the judge that these eight pages do not belong to the museum, to the Getty. They are, and I'm going to do this the way she did it, the patrimony of the Armenian people. And then you have the uh, elderly Armenians standing in the back. And I think that was a very important point to make to the judge. And then he ruled in a very important ruling that the case can go forward. And so you can see that the participation of the Armenian community from the young to the old, it's such a critical component. I began teaching a course uh, 20 years, 24 years ago on law and genocide. I've taught that course at various law schools, both in the United States and abroad. I hope someday to teach it also in Armenia. But one of the things that I noticed with regard to when I meet someone and taking that course who's an Armenian uh, of heritage law student, whether it's in the United States or somewhere else, when they come up and they talk to me, and, and I sort of understand why they're taking a course on law genocide as opposed to another course, there's kind of this, as they talk about the Armenian genocide, and just use the word genocide, there's this energy that I can literally feel coming from those students. And I have to say that same energy does not come from my Jewish students. You know, it, it, it is that legacy okay, that these students carry. And they carry because of the nihilism, which everyone has talked about, becomes a very important point. What is it that can be done? And this is why when um, we talk about the what's next, this is a real what's next. You know, thank you for the opening remarks and recognizing exactly that this is something can be done specifically, you know, and something that can make a difference. Uh, Raphael Lemkin, who is the, um, coined the term genocide, Polish Jewish lawyer, like me, I'm also Polish and Jewish and a lawyer, um, and said in um, his original formulation that one form of genocide is cultural genocide, the destruction of culture. And cultural genocide did not make it into the genocide convention. That's one of the criticisms that we have in the bargaining between the nations when they went ahead and issued the genocide convention. But that doesn't mean that cultural genocide is not is something to be ignored, because we know that it occurs in every single conflict. And as Professor Thiel just showed us, it is occurring now as we speak. Who knows you know, what the Russian troops are doing in the occupied parts of Ukraine and what kind of cultural objects they are you know, finding, destroying, moving to Russia, moving to Crimea and saying, no, no, this is not Ukrainian, this is Russian. This belongs to us. These are not Ukrainian icons, they are Russian icons. 
So you can see how, how important that is. Um, Hegner just gave you a wonderful you know, rundown of the, what we did and the summer that we had. I have to also say that as we were working on this, the three of us were in different places at different times. So sometimes I was taking these weekly calls with the students, you know, from Europe at four in the morning. Other times it was, uh, you know, Professor Akcham was somewhere else. Some of them, you, know, you were on a camping trip, I remember, with your kids. But we wanted to make sure that we, we make the project go and we meet every single week on Zoom. Thank you, Zoom, for else to be able to do that and to get it moving forward. Um, I also you know, want to thank Nanor and Hasmik, um, such important people. You know, when you work with people that have the passion for this and really want to do this and recognize the importance of it, it energized all of us you know, to do so. So I'm really looking forward now to the students speaking. But I'll tell you, I'll end on a personal note. Um, this summer, I took one of my daughters uh, to Poland. Uh, she's in high school. She was going to be going to college. And we went to different museums, we on different sites. Obviously, we looked at a lot of the vestiges of the Holocaust because her grandparents, my parents, they were children when the Holocaust came. And what the thing that she remembered and brought back with her was going to a Polish museum where there were Polish paintings and then empty frames. And the empty frames stood for Polish art that was stolen by the Germans, where the Poles are still waiting for that art to be returned. And, you know, I made mention of that. Uh, you know, Bianca knows what I do. But I then she told me as she's applying for, you know, college, in her essays, that's what she mentioned. So you never know, you know, what individuals, what they're struck, what's important. But this is an important project. So I want to guarantee to the students that are here, you at least have one successor. Uh, I don't know what uh, major Bianca Basler will take, but she is taking ceramics. And as soon as she's able to, uh, she's going to be joined the Agla Research Projects. And you can go ahead and give her work to do in order to move this forward. Thank you so much. I would now like to invite uh, Serena Penengan to the stage, who will be moderating a discussion among the researchers from our summer research project. Thank you to everyone for being here today. My name is Serena Karina Pelingyan, and I am in my last semester at the Chapman University Dale E. Fowler School of Law. Professor Basler, who just spoke, was my first year civil procedure professor, and he tended to talk about his work in Armenian genocide restitution. And I would go up to him after class and say, I'm Armenian too, and I'm so curious about what you're doing. And we had a lot of discussions at that point. Um, and he always knew about my interest in this type of work. And so last year in the hallway, he caught me and he said, I signed you up for a project. And I said, OK, what did you sign me up for? And he said, AGLARP, the Armenian Genocide Looted Art Research Project. And today I'm here and I've been on this project since last year. We've been working with amazing researchers who like has been mentioned week after week would come bring their research together talk about what they found. And often these researchers did more than what they, we were asked of them because they were genuinely interested in justifying and fixing the wrongs that have happened to the Armenian people. And like has been mentioned as well, the denial of what has happened. This is just the beginning of a long and fruitful road and a long journey ahead. And I know that even when I'm a lawyer, I'm still going to be working on this project. Some of our students are here to share with us their work and their experience of what last summer was like and the project that they will still be working on as well. So first, we have Dikran Khodanyan, a researcher serving as an indexer at the USC Shoah Foundation. 
Gregory Mihanjian, a second year student at Chapman University's Fowler School of Law. Ani Parnagyan on the advisory team at the Fine Art Group. And we have Angelina Safanapich, an attorney who graduated from Loyola Law School in 2022. Please welcome them. Angie, would you like to start us off? Yeah. Um, sorry, can everyone hear me okay? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angie Sofimpanich, and I was one of the researchers uh, with Agla RP this summer. So I was interested in this project because of my background with genocide law and Holocaust reparations. Um, as you can probably see, I'm not Armenian myself, um, but I've worked on cases related to the conflict in the region, um, and I wanted to get involved in this project um, because I, kind of with an eye towards restitution as a sort of logical next step in seeing this sort of work through. Um, so my presentation today, I'm going to briefly kind of focus on the research methodology and sort of give you um, a more in-depth behind the scenes look at the iterative processes, um, particularly the preliminary steps that goes into um, a momentous undertaking like this project. Um, as Professor Juan and Powell and Professor Basler have discussed, um, this summer we were given the task of identifying Armenian art um, and other cultural objects that were looted or transferred in conjunction with the genocide. Um, now on this face, these research parameters um, beget innumerable possibilities and seem very daunting. Like how does one even begin to tackle something of this scope? Um, but if there's anything that was kind of drilled into me, um, my first year legal research and writing class, it's the importance of preparation organization and devising very specific methodical research strategies before diving into anything. So everyone has kind of a slightly different approach to conceptualizing what research is, um, but in this case, I think it was most helpful to first think of kind of about the core questions um, related to the subject at hand of Armenian genocide looted art. So first, the what, you know, what even are Armenian objects? What sort of objects are we looking at? Um, in this field of work, illuminated manuscripts tend to get the most attention um, but what about the other items um, like textiles, stonework, kakars, um, and what makes something Armenian, um, given the history of the region, the diasporas, um, the changing national boundaries over time, what does this label encompass for our purposes? And nailing this down essentially helped us determine the sort of search terms and areas uh, and items that we were looking for. Then the when. Uh, essentially, what, when, what was the significant period for our purposes of research? What dates of transference or gaps in the provenance raise particular red flags for us? Um, and this is sort of related to the next question, which is the why. Um, why are we doing this research to begin with? You know, the core of this project is to identify objects that were looted, uh, wrongfully re removed in the context of the genocide, which spanned, you know, depending on the historian, usually, but usually 1915 to 1923. However, when I delve deeper into sort of like the background of the Armenian genocide, I also encountered uh, the Hamidian massacres in the 1890s and the Adana massacre in 1909. You know, while these uh, mass atrocities were not considered part of the genocide for the legal definition um, by the Genocide Convention, but the mass displacement, death, and violence against the Armenian people during this uh, period would likely have facilitated a similar environment of looting Armenian objects. Um, so this kind of suggested a need to expand the uh, range of dates we were looking at. And finally, the where. Determining where to search works perhaps the bulk of the preliminary uh, preparation. Um, as Professor Lonapal explained, uh, the researchers were assigned um, different court circuits. So I was assigned the second and third circuits, which were Connecticut, New York, Vermont, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. And so the way I went about breaking down this search was as follows. First, I consulted Professor Sanjan's catalog of Armenian manuscripts, making note of institutions that had items um, and what they were. And an important takeaway from this uh, list was actually that many of the repositories tended to be universities and particularly big names like Ivy League schools. Um, then I completed a list, uh, a compiled list essentially of all the museums and galleries in each state, which is quite a lot, uh, using a combination of Google, uh, Wikipedia, and state tourism websites. And then next, I went through this list and eliminated any areas um, that 
on their face basically seemed they wouldn't have any relevant materials. You know, for example, don't think there's going to be a lot of Armenian objects in the American Museum of Tort Law. Finally, I went back and did the same with the libraries and higher education institutions. Um, based on Professor Sanjan's list, I focus on those schools that were more likely to have the kind of prestige and, you know, honestly, therefore the funding to acquire and upkeep um, such objects. And now only with all these steps taken uh, did I then dial, did we then delve into the research um, using the lists and search terms we generated to methodically comb through different institutional databases. You know, while all this prep work may seem a little tedious, it makes the actual research process when we get into it much more streamlined because we basically have a clearer picture of what we're looking for, um, which makes the following step of the data collection uh, much more efficient, particularly when it comes to flagging objects of interest. Um, I'm just going to touch really briefly on the data collection process itself because Professor Wanpa um, already discussed it, but we um, basically input our findings into our database um, and captured the crucial information, um, such as catalog number, location, this physical description, most importantly, any available provenance. And this paired with the earlier parameters we established um, in our research plan was basically what we used to determine whether the circumstances between uh, around an object's acquisition was perhaps a little suspect. Um, and in the process of this work, we began to build a database of figures of interest, the cast of characters um, that tended to pop up frequently in the world of Armenian art, uh, like Kevorkian. Um, and this thus created another avenue for future research to explore. So a core benefit of having a clear step-by-step -step research plan and documenting this process in the way that we did is that essentially looking forward to the future creates a clear trail to guide future researchers. You know, for example, someone looking at our work um, can see what areas we've already explored, what sort of search terms were effective, what was maybe not so successful. And while our project is only beginning, the hope is that um, essentially to, you know, use a dreaded math term, showing our work, um, this will allow those that come after us to kind of trace our steps, see how we came by our findings, and then determine the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Angie, for going through the research methodology. Greg, would you like to take the seat? Sure thing. Potev, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, just see, there we go. We can just get to the first slide right there. Although I did add a Yera coin on Aglarp just because. Um, there we go. Okay, my assigned area was the upper half of the Ninth Circuit, essentially being the Pacific Northwest plus our friends in Nevada. Um, my suspicions of a general lack of Armenian cultural presence were confirmed, uh, albeit there were a number of pleasant surprises. As we know, there are just bustling Armenian communities in these states. I kid, there aren't. Uh, we know where the Armenian communities are. That said, my search began by simply going state by state and accumulating all the institutions that would be likely holders of Armenian art. Uh, this process re resulted in a large number of general natural history museums and then, of course, art museums throughout each state. One helpful tool uh, that made this process a lot more streamlined was the Art Encyclopedia website that just lists art museums in every single state. And that was given to me by one of my colleagues. She was here earlier, but I think she had to leave. But a thank you for that. Um, now, for each of the museums in each respective state, so Idaho, Montana, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, I took a look at all the museum's past and current exhibits that they've advertised to the public. Any guesses on if these yielded anything? Let's think positively. If you thought negatively, you're right. I'm sorry to say, but that's just the truth. Um, the areas where I actually did have some success, though, were deep dive searches into their personal, into their private collections within each museum. Uh, if possible, which it usually was, I would narrow the search by region or time period to kind of take away, like, I don't need to look in East Asia, I don't need to look at like, South Africa or anything like that, I just want to focus on the Caucasus and the Middle East. Um, and then also narrowing the time period to more medieval artworks, because modern artworks typically post 50s, you know, anything post-genocide area I wasn't necessarily that concerned with because it wasn't something that would have been stolen during the genocide. Um, then I would use the many keywords we had discussed in our weekly meetings uh, to see what would pop up. So some common words are things you can probably guess. Armenia, Armenian, Christian, Persian, Ottoman, Byzantine, Turkish, 
Orthodox, Bible, Middle East, Caucasus, any of those, just seeing what artwork is going to pop up. And the following were some of the results. Uh, regarding the state of Idaho, now despite the fact that I view the Armenian people as lovers of Kitna Khansur or the potato, Idaho yielded nothing. Um, Montana was actually a big surprise for me because I, I know we like to travel to Montana. It's gorgeous. Dukhan loves to travel to Montana. Uh, there's lots of great nature to see there, but I didn't know about much of an Armenian community there. Um, there was one museum in Montana, the Montana Museum of Art and Culture that yielded two items of Armenian origin uh, that you'll see one of them in a moment. In Oregon, there was the Portland Art Museum that yielded seven items. It was the most. Uh, for two of these items, I followed Professor Wattenpog's recommendation of reaching out to one uh, Miss Sato Mughalian. Uh, she is a relative of one of the cited artists. I couldn't find anything online on this artist, but she's a relative. And uh, to my surprise, she had a wealth of information regarding the items. She knew the arguments that they had to go through to have the artist properly cited. And I say that to emphasize the importance of doing this work as an organized project because otherwise I would have never known about Sato Mughalian. I would have never been able to reach out for her. There was nothing on the museum's webpage suggesting that I could reach out to her. It took being part of an organized group, having a professor who you know, is focused on this area to say, oh, I've seen that name before, reach out to this person. And then they sent me paragraphs of information that I uploaded to the drive for future researchers to look into. Uh, regarding the state of Washington, uh, the state yielded three museums holding Armenian art. The Mary Hill Museum of Art, the Henry Art Gallery, and Seattle Art Museum all had interesting uh, items that warrant a closer look uh, into their available provenances. Nevada, regrettably, um, I, nothing really came up based on my search method in Nevada either. And if we can briefly go to the next and final slide. So here's the one from Montana. It is a... Um, Silver binding featuring Christ and mother and child. And you see at the at the top, it says artist unknown, 17th, early 18th century. So it's old enough to be in the hands of someone during the genocide. So there's a, but then at the bottom, culture Armenian, I have the catalog number. So this is how, this is a good find. I didn't expect to find anything in Montana, but then there's no provenance. There's nothing listed. All I know based on this, when I found it, is that's a gift of Stella Duncan. I don't know who Stella Duncan is. I looked up Stella Duncan. She's not on LinkedIn. I can't find her there. I don't know who she is. I don't know how to access how she got her hands on these Armenian pieces of art. It's a big endeavor that takes further research, while at the same time, considering the legal perspectives of not putting people on notice of the fact that you're trying to get these pieces of art back because that, change, that makes things a lot more complicated. We saw earlier, with even with Holocaust pieces of art where you knew the provenance, you knew exactly how it was stolen, that it could take you going to the Supreme Court to get it back. And we are even struggling to find some of these provenances because they're hidden away and people don't wanna come forward for obvious reasons. They may have paid good money for these pieces of art, even though it didn't belong to them and it's gonna be hard to convince them to get it back, which will usually result in litigation. On a personal note, I just want to just emphasize that this project inspired me to continue this work within legal academia. Uh, I, like it was said, I'm a 2L I'm in my second year at Chapman Law School. I'm a member of the Chapman Law Review, which is the school's uh, academic journal publication. Uh, part of that is I'm obligated to write a legal article. Every member is to be considered for publication. Uh, I elected to write my article with Professor Baszler as my um, advisor for directed research on the continuation of this project. Briefly, I, I'm exploring the creation of legal forums here in California, arguing for the revival of some things, seeing if field preemption can be defeated, which is a big task. It usually can't, but there may be ways that I'll be looking into, um, as well as an argument for a federal act, either of its own name, of its own accord, something to, or um, an amendment to the HERE Act, which was made earlier. And that would be a job for our friends at the ANCA and Armenian Assembly in DC to uh, get to work on that and do their grass movements that way. But that, those are my findings and uh, thank you again for having me. Doug is a great example of the types of surprises that you can find during this research and a lot of the researchers had the same experience. So it's been very interesting. Ani? Yes, hi. Um, I was 
similarly tasked with a circuit, but ended up doing most of my research on uh, archives in New York. Um, I have a degree in art history, so I'm more on the art side of it than my colleagues up here are lawyers. Um, and uh, one of the main archives I looked at was the archives of Upper Arthur Upham Pope at the New York Public Library. Um, so the next slide, please. Arthur Upham Pope is uh, from Rhode Island. He um, got a degree from Brown, attended grad school at Brown, Harvard, and Cornell. He's not Armenian, um, and he's not even Persian, but he uh, was an art historian and a scholar specifically on Persian art. Um, something that we've mentioned here today is that Armenian art can sometimes be categorized under these names of Persian, Ottoman. So uh, although he was a scholar on Persian art, um, we suspected that he came across a lot of Armenian artwork looted, uh, especially because he was working in the 1920s in that period, right after the genocide. Um, so he was particularly interested in Persian art, uh, Persian rugs and art at, at that time in the 20s. And he was an advisor for the Met, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Philadelphia Museum, and then private collectors such as Kaluz Gulbenkian, John D. Rockefeller Jr. And he was publishing catalogs and giving presentations and really involved in the art market and art world of the 1920s. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, at the New York Public Library, 21 boxes of his personal correspondence um, live there. He catalogs his work as an art advisor, his trips to Iran to see Persian monuments and art and meet with artists, uh, journal articles, lectures, correspondence from his wife, uh, Dr. Phyllis Ackerman Pope, who was also a Persian art scholar. Um, and so going into these archives, my goal was to uh, ask a couple of questions. Who was selling artwork at the time, especially Armenian, Persian, Near Eastern art? Who were the Armenian art scholars? Who were the experts that these guys were referencing? And what looted Armenian art was on the market? Um, what items could we actually identify as being sold at this time? So here, um, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but he makes mention to Persian and Armenians um, and their influence at the time and how he's working with all of these different um, archives. Next slide. And one of the names that this led to um, was the art dealer Dikran Kelekian, who was also living at the same time um, and was born in Kayseri, Turkey, began selling art and antiques in Istanbul, uh, expanded to New York, London, Paris, and Cairo, and was uh, settled here in, in the United States before the genocide. So he was seeing all of these Armenians come in, seeing them with their objects, um, and was probably involved in the, in the sale of many of these pieces. He was similarly advisor to these big names, the Walters Museum, Rockefeller, Charles Freer, where we know art archives, art pieces live today, that we have questions about their provenance. Um, and he was dealing too in this Armenian, Islamic, and Persian art like Arthur Upham Pope. Um, and through my, the archives, you could see them communicating together. Um, and much of his collection is held at the Metropolitan Museum, as well as his archive of personal papers. Um, but they're harder to access, which is another sort of conversation we had over the summer about availability of all of this. Um, and so, like uh, Angie mentioned, we put together this cast of characters um, and started piecing together who was in contact at the time and who might have been uh, dealing with these Armenian pieces. Um, so we have the Kerekian, we have the Kevorkian, we have Arthur Upham Pope, we have uh, art and antiques jewelers like the Injujam brothers, um, Kent Klostikian, who was working in rugs, and a lot of these I, we were able to sort of put together because of their mention in the Arthur Upham Pope papers. We weren't able to necessarily identify a specific piece, but you're understanding where, what names you might be looking for in the provenance, for example. Um, and so even though we haven't identified specific pieces necessarily through this archival work, it's given us an incredible framework, I think, to move forward. Um, and so if we can move to the next slide, um, that's where there's more work to do and where this has given us sort of hints to where 
the items we're looking for might live. Um, he worked with the Philadelphia Sesquicentennial Exposition, where there was exhibitions on Persian and Armenian art. There's likely catalogs um, listing specific items and their provenance. Um, Dikran Kalekian's archives with the Kalus Kulbenkian Museum, who he worked closely with. Um, all of these different different archives and directories that are needed for further research and the Kalekian archives at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, so it's long, laborious, painstaking process. It's um, all by hand, it's looking through pieces and it's needle in a haystack findings. Um, but I think it is a treasure trove of knowledge that we can continue to mine to be able to identify pieces and then be able to move to the litigation stage. It's really the art perspective that brings all of the, this project together, because without that, the project would not be as complete as it is. So thank you, Ani. Dikran? Uh, so I am also not a lawyer. This is working, right? Everyone can hear me? Uh, I think my role in this project was to bring a completely different uh, lens, a completely different component, one that uh, has also inspired me a little bit, uh, not a little bit, a lot, uh, and I have just one slide here to support the statements that I'm about to make. Uh, I work at the USC Shoah Foundation, where there is a collection or you rent collections of testimonies of Armenian genocide survivors. My job is to listen to these testimonies day in and day out and index minute by minute uh, what these survivors are speaking about. This is not necessarily limited to the topic at hand here today, which is uh, Armenian genocide looted art, but we're tracing back anything and everything about what these genocide survivors can remember. If they're born in the 1890s and they're speaking about growing up in the village of Marash and then experiencing the deportations, the Armenian genocide, the marches, and then ultimately becoming refugees, migrating and ending up in the diaspora and starting a completely new life somewhere, this is the story of what we're going through. I am listening to these stories. They can be in Armenian, they could be in English, they could be in the specific dialect in Armenian that these survivors are speaking in, and they range from one hour to 10 hours. So I just wanna give you all an understanding of how tedious this task is. It is also ongoing, my research is ongoing because I currently still work there and any uh, of my findings that I find essential to this project, I am more than happy to cooperate uh, and obviously uh, provide. Uh, but it's also what this project made me realize is that in the last few years when uh, we've seen what has taken place in Artsakh, I've also worked with various groups that have also uh, documented the current displaced Armenians of Artsakh and what has happened to them. So I just wanna provide a perspective of how a century later, um, I'm listening to Armenian genocide survivors uh, from over a century ago, talking about their stories of displacement, what they lost, what they experienced, uh, yet it's also 2024, and I'm still listening to stories of displacement, uh, loss, and so forth. So this is why what we're doing is um, very significant and very important. So with that being said, uh, my research uh, links to the following four points. When I listen to these testimonies, I have the opportunity and the potential of documenting what was lost. Sometimes in these testimonies, these survivors discuss their homes. They tell you how many cows their family owned. They tell you uh, the material of what their floors were made out of. And they tell you if their family was wealthy, if they had jewels, uh, if they had specific paintings, if they had specific artifacts at home. And they're able to document all of this. That's one. They're able to provide you a first-hand primary source of what they have. Second, they provide, they identify what was stolen from them. They identify that while they were being persecuted, how it was looted, Ottoman gendarmes came into their homes or through the marches, through the deportations, what was exactly taken from them or what they had to resort to uh, to use as financial means to survive, but essentially they identify A to Z what was in their possession 
and what they had to lose in order to survive, or what was taken from them through the, uh, in the, during the Armenian Genocide. And it also provides a contextual understanding of what was going on. Because at the time, the Armenian Genocide, uh, during the Armenian Genocide, uh, there was forced displacement, there was destruction, there was intentional looting and uh, the destruction of Armenian properties, whether it was churches, uh, historic cultural sites, and so forth. So uh, my research will provide the motivation as to why uh, the Ottoman authorities were taking part in this type of destruction, this type of looting, uh, and the theft. Uh, and lastly, um, legal evidence. Um, if these survivors are able to document uh, and accurately describe what they had, what they lost, uh, it could support claims. It could support um, claims of pos possible restitution and the return of uh, this stolen artwork. So. Uh, the, the focus and importance of my research is that it, if whatever I'm, I'm able to find accommodates all of these points, we can make huge progress in this research. But I have to be extremely blunt and honest when I say it's very difficult um, for these survivors to be telling their stories. And that's why it still takes a lot of time and tedious work and research to get to your findings. because. Um, some of these testimonies are video. You get to actually see uh, this person uh, talk about their story, uh, the struggles, and the emotions that they're experiencing. Um, so I think I'll conclude it over there, but I want to thank uh, you all again for allowing me to participate and uh, provide my role in this project. As Dikran said, this research is more relevant than ever. So we thank you for being here and paying attention. I think we have time for questions. A couple questions, possibly. Yes, we have time for question and answers. But I have a small surprise for you, because we are talking about young generation, I mean, that inspires us, and that they will continue our dreams. And we have a young candidate here for UCLA, a high school student just uh, graduated from high school, and he has a wonderful story to tell you. He's in a project uh, involved, and I'm thankful to him. He has asked to me to be his advisor. Levon, why don't you come here and tell you what you are doing? What's your project about? You want, should I use this one? Or? Yes, you can. You Thank you, Taner. Thank you, Taner, for the introduction. So my name is Levon Alianakian. I'm a senior in high school. And I'm here to present. Well, I visited 50 countries, and I visited Armenian churches in 22 countries. And this summer, I traveled to Lebanon and Syria to document the state of the current Armenian churches and schools in both countries and found out some really interesting things. So to start off, we started in Burj Hamoud in Lebanon. Um, we I found the Armenian spirit there to be like nowhere else. People talking about in Armenian, using the Armenian language in every context, like of business, in every context of social life. And six-year-old children on the street talking in Armenian to each other. So I felt like really at home. And then we went and traveled around the back of Lebanon. We went to Tripoli where there was a school with 200 students, 40 of whom were Armenian and the other 160 full paying to uh, Arab Christians, paying for the tuition and scholarships of the Armenians. And the, those 40 Armenians were actually orphans from Biblos, transported from 40 miles away by, by bus every day. So, What's my point? Today we gather here to, because we all want to preserve the Armenian culture, history, and monuments that we have. And in Lebanon and Syria, we have so many grand monuments I couldn't, that I couldn't have imagined. Like when we went into Syria, it took me six months to get a special cultural visa. We went with a government sanctioned tour guide. We began in Damascus, 
And through a bunch of checkpoints and everything, we worked our way up to Aleppo. Um, Aleppo has had, so in the 17th century, there were 8,000 Armenians in Aleppo. In 1925, after the withdrawal of French troops from Kilikia, there were about upwards of 100,000. And in 2010, before the Syrian civil war, there was a recorded 40,000 Armenians. And today, present day, there's eight to 10,000 Armenians left in Aleppo. Syria is, their economy is in shambles. There is no banking. And the Armenian diaspora there is just totally isolated from, you know, from us, from the diaspora, sorry, the Armenians there. And there's no way for them to receive remittance or anything. And we're talking about the preservation of Armenian cultural art and culture, like, you know, significant historical documents. And in Aleppo, the treasury, after the 2022 earthquake, closed its museum. This is a centuries old treasury. And, you know, I hope they have catalogs and stuff, but they, when we were there, we interviewed each priest of each church, each teacher of each school, and the priest said that they're sending all of the things that they have to Lebanon for safety reasons. So it's important that we draw attention to this issue because not only do we have to restitute the art that we have lost, but we also have to preserve what we still have. And this, this, the Patriarchate in Aleppo was actually built in 600 AD and you know, refurbished throughout history. But there, I can imagine there's some really, really old documents there that we need to protect in every way possible. Lastly, the most fun part of the trip was when we went to Kesab and surround, surrounding villages in the Latakia area. We weren't able to go to some churches in Yakubia, like in some of the deeper parts of Idlib because they're under Kurdish control. But in Kesab, we found the same spirit. We found the Armenians speaking a totally different dialect. And we went to a remote village, Aramo. In Aramo, they've forgotten Armenian over time. These villages have been populated by Armenians as early as the fourth century. There's very little known. Village of 800, half of whom are Armenian. And we saw some old, old churches, sixth century church, Surp Stefanos, Armenian church with Armenian inscriptions. We saw a cave church. We don't know how old that is, but there's a lot of research to be done in this area, and there's a lot of documents to be protected. So, you know, as we gather to talk about protecting and preserving Armenian heritage, I draw your attention to, you know, what's happening in Lebanon and Syria, and that we should continue studying it further. Thank, Thank you, you so Thomas. much, Lebanon. I have to add. Go ahead. Uh, I have to add, he took images of all of these churches, the inside, the paintings. He took videos of these uh, Armenian cultural monuments there. And I hope he's going to be a UCLA student and will write a book about this project. Thank you, Levon. <laughs> Yes, now, Hegnar, you, I ask you also to come, or uh, please, now it's the question and answer period. Yes, Wolf. Uh, yeah, but I, I give, you can't take this. Thank you, Dana. Uh, I have a question for Ali. First of all, congratulations, and that's really inspiring project, and I hope this goes on for a long time with many more results. But a question for Ali. So I was noticing that uh, among your findings uh, with all kind of these different art dealers, there uh, was a dominance of European or North American names and Armenian names. I wonder if, they, if you find, uh, found any Turkish uh, kind of art dealers, uh, because, this, because I was reminded after the Holocaust, uh, there were na uh, former Nazi art dealers who then after the war were still dealing looted art. And so I wonder if this plays any role there. Yeah, um, I didn't come across any specific names of Turkish art dealers, but um, there were plenty of mentions of 
Turkish hands that it had passed through and mentions of sort of stops in their in their history there. Um, but I I didn't mention see any of the uh, Turkish names. I want to also note that I was only able to make it through a couple of those 21 boxes. Um, so even just in that archive, there's probably some missing information that still needs to be uncovered. Yeah, of course, I, I couldn't help but notice as well the the number of Armenian names on that on that list, and of course, the fact that there are Armenian names on the list doesn't mean that they weren't also engaged in improper uh, behavior. And uh, similarly, some of these objects may uh, have landed in what we might call Armenian institutions. And I wonder if if the the logic of the project is, is to pursue this to determine if objects in, in Armenian, uh, in either institutions in Armenia or otherwise Armenian institutions, uh, have, have these objects as well, if only for the sake of, of rounding out the historical record. Thank you. Actually, I'll try to answer both questions. Um, so the, the, the incredible work that the researchers are doing, we're still dealing with certain kinds of data asymmetry. So Ani, for example, uh, the archives that she's looking at, she's able to track the movement of objects once they've arrived at major art centers like Paris or New York. That's when Pope and Kelekian and some of the others become involved. But they're buying from other people in the former Ottoman Empire, now Republic of Turkey. And we have very few ways of accessing that information. That's why Ani and I really want to get into the Kelekian archives. Our dream is that maybe we'll find his account ledgers, his personal notes. Um, he, I doubt that he has saved them. Let's hope that he has. Some art dealers, you you have their ledgers. They're now available in archives. And some have a lot of information, and somehow don't some of them do not have a lot of information. So we have to remember how much uh, knowledge is not accessible to us, maybe because this knowledge was not kept, or maybe because this knowledge is in Turkish archives, and accessing them would require going through a number of other hoops. Um, and your uh, very important question, Mark, um, what if some of these Agla-seeming objects are in Armenian institutions? Uh, what then? Um, I think our goal is to gather the information and to trace them. And then we, we can continue to have conversations. One institution that has been a destination for Armenian art of various kinds, including Armenian genocide looted art, is of course the, Medi the Madenataran in, Arme in the Re Republic of Armenia, the uh, Mashtots Institute of Ancient Manuscripts. And they actually have mounted exhibitions where um, they talk about objects, uh, I mean, they collect mostly manuscripts in their collection that arrived there th because they were donated by survivors or because during the First World War, the Catholicos uh, Kevork V sent special um, you know, missions of priests to protect or, and salvage whatever um, religious objects uh, had remained in the sort of east, what is today Eastern Turkey area. So the Madenataran has engaged in their own research about what we would call Armenian genocide looted art. But I think that's a really important dimension of this. Uh, so my goal is to ultimately be able to create a completely comprehensive and detailed picture of what was Armenian cultural heritage before April 1915, what happened to it, where is it now, how much of it was destroyed, how much of it survives. And as to what should happen to it, that's the next, the next discussion. I just want to add how important it is for those of us that are not in the art field, art history field. Um, 
the work and the knowledge and the methodology that uh, art historians bring, um, it's critical. We could not have done this without Hegner telling us exactly what to do, how to do it, what things we look for. Um, I, I want to point out that, you know, as part of this project, um, we also reached out to an art history professor at Chapman University, Justin Walsh, who's sitting in the back, who will participate in the very last panel, because we need, <laughs> you know, the the art historians, the people that know this, um, to help us out. I can relate to this because in the 1990s, when the Holocaust restitution movement started, um, it was the uh, researchers who went to the um, U.S. You know, National Archives and started finding stuff that no one knew existed. It's like that last scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark. They had been there for so many years, and then one researcher went, and they found it, and then it was like, I remember speaking to someone at the National Archives, and I said, every day someone would come in, and they wanted to, you know, let's, can I look at the Nazi files? Can I look at the so-and-so? I don't know. It could be that our National Archives, all of a sudden, we'll have a slew of people coming in and looking, you know, at those. Um, the possibilities are, are such, um, you know, there's, there's a lot there. But Mark, I'm really glad you asked that question because what it does is it shows us that this project continues, the search continues, you know, and the fact that we just don't know what we'll find. You know, our original uh, search of, you know, what the, the students have talked about, it yielded, you know, some information about some objects in American museums that we thought, hmm, maybe, right? But we don't know, but at least raise the question, you know, how was this object obtained at this particular museum? You know, and we couldn't have done that without someone actually going on the ground and doing it, but being told by someone like Hegnar, this is what you look for. And that day becomes really critical, you know, in doing that. Um, I have to ask also these students, their passion, their engagement energize us also. This is also very important to underline. I mean, we are so thankful to all of you for your contribution, for your engagement, for your energy and enthusiasm in doing this. And believe us, I mean, every week when after your meetings, we called each other, we said that you see, you see these students, they will continue what we are dreaming. So thank you so much to all of you. If we don't have any further questions, none or what are we doing now? Coffee pause? Coffee break. So, okay, we have a coffee break now. Thank you. I prefer that.
don't think so. Stock is stacked there and we'll stacked up. Behind. It'll be behind him. No, that was a good idea. That was a good call. Mm -hmm. Or the other panel. Yeah. That's good. I didn't realize that was going to be a thing. Yeah. But and if we had put the chairs down there, that's not. Yeah. Yeah. Is that all right? That's all right. Is it hard for you to feel okay for that to put the chairs? Oh, but there's a monitor in here. Oh, the camera. No, I mean, like, I think that's like, 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 that's like,
No, it was here.
that's a clincher. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our conference on Armenian Genocide, Looted Art, and Restitution. Our next speaker, Simon Marakian, is an investigative researcher and cultural heritage defender. He is a PhD candidate in heritage crime at Great Britain's Defense Academy at Cranfield University, a community scholar at the University of Denver, a visiting scholar at Tufts University, and an incoming postdoctoral fellow at Oxford University's Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. Thank you, and please help me in welcoming Mr. Marakian. Thank you, Nanor. Thank you, UCLA Armenian Promise Institute. And thank you to the audience for being here and the research team for the incredible work they have done so far and will continue doing. And thank you, Professor Akcham, for requiring my presence here at this conference. Now, I'm going to talk about my research, mostly about heritage crime and how that impacts the future of Armenian sites in Turkey and in Azerbaijan. My background is political science, so that means believing in theories like realism that says we need to look at the world as it is so that we can provide solutions for the problems that we face collectively. So I will speak about three things, documentation, dissection, and deterrence. My research started 
in late 2005, when as a 19-year-old, I heard about the destruction of the world's largest medieval Armenian cemetery, Jura or Julfa. I'd heard of this place from my father, and I was looking for news coverage on BBC and CNN, and I saw no word about it anywhere online. And so in some ways, this became something for me to study, to document, and build awareness about. And finally, in 2013, I saw the site with my own eyes when I visited the Iranian border. And you saw, just as you can see on the screen, a flat field, as if nothing ever existed there, just as Azerbaijan's government had intended. Between 1997 and 2006, the Aliyev regime destroyed the entire historical landscape of this region. And as I was there, I could not help but think, what could we have done to prevent this? Heritage crime is the study of illegal and illicit activities impacting cultural properties and sacred sites. It's a term that was introduced in the 1990s. I'm involved in probably the first PhD program in the world in the study. And that includes a forensic component of documenting erasure and cultural theft and other illicit and illegal activities that take place. So a lot of this is journalistic work, uh, work field research, OSINT investigations, et cetera. But theories, as I mentioned earlier, are also important because we really need to understand why destruction and looting take, take place and how that can be prevented. And that's where deterrence comes in. So I want to mention the different documentation projects that exist when it concerns Armenian heritage in Turkey. There is the ongoing field research by research on Armenian architecture that have been doing this work for decades. They go every year without announcing their field work ahead of time and document sites of Armenian heritage in Turkey. The Herandink Foundation has done something similar and created a database of not just Armenian, but also Greek, Syriac, uh, and Jewish heritage, numbering about 9,500 sites. There is ongoing research by scholars, including Hernar Wattenpaz, Stephen Sim, whose work was featured in Ani Hovanisian's recent documentary, Ara Sarafian, Christina Maranti, and looting specific fieldwork in Mush and Van by scholars Onder Celik and Alice von Bieberstein, and of course, pilgrim accounts from Armenians. There is a new research by USERF, which is the US Commission on International Religious Freedom that came out in November, very relevant, and I'll talk about it a little later. There was a 2013 Ani in Context Assessment Workshop by World Monuments Fund, also very important because it looked at the sites in the Ani region today and what can be done to save some of them. My own research in 2014, funded by the Gulbenkian Foundation of Fieldwork to assess preservation and destruction factors in Turkey and in Azerbaijan. And of course, the potential employment of satellite imagery that are currently underutilized. We have seen satellite images by Caucasus Heritage Watch and others showing destruction that's happening with our, to Armenian cemeteries in Artsakh under Azerbaijani control, but we have not seen satellites used in documenting looting practice, practices in Turkey. This has been done in other areas, including in Egypt, but we're dealing with a different terrain where it's much flatter and the destruction is easier to document through satellites. But there's other ways of using OSINT investigations, uh, including looking at looters in Turkey who are openly promoting the culture of treasure hunting. I'm satellites, we might be able to spot some of the bigger looting pits, but a lot of that happens inside churches in ways that are unable to be documented through satellite imagery, unlike the destruction of Julfa, which I and the American Association for the Advancement of Science documented first in 2006 in a documentary that I worked on with Sarah Pickman, and then the 2009 study, which was probably the first satellite investigation in heritage crime. And unfortunately, that's, this became a popular practice in the 2010s during ISIS's targeting of cultural monuments. We also have some other work that has come out in recent years. In this work with Cox's Heritage Watch, I utilized declassified uh, 
imagery to compare the existence of Armenian sites in Nakhichevan during the Soviet era and in today, reconfirming the complete erasure that has taken place in that area. Now, OSIN investigations are not limited to satellites, so we should not over rely on those things. Just go to Google, put in Turkey, and detector, detector. Hundreds of stores will come up. Here are some of the major ones in the Istanbul area alone. Go to YouTube and put in treasure hunting, and you will find many accounts, including some of this with millions of followers, where they train and actually loot Armenian heritage sites. Some of them want to have a lot more viewers, so they will often produce fake videos, but a lot of them are pretty genuine. The other side of numismatics. Um, this is a conversation that needs to happen in the Armenian community and in other collective circles. The coins that document Armenian history are often the primary target of the looting operations because those are the items that are detected as metals. And as we know, archaeologists consider coins the smoke screens of archaeology. If those sites are removed from metal detection prospects, we may never be able to find such cultural sites in the future. Now, looting in Turkey, the ongoing looting that's happening today, not during the genocide, not 50 years ago, but it's happening right now at this moment, is not just a crime of opportunity. There's, this is why we know it. So the recent research by USERV looked at active Armenian churches in mostly in the Istanbul area. They are disproportionately higher attacks against Armenian, active Armenian sites, as opposed to other Christian properties, indigenous Christian properties throughout Turkey. So it's not just looting of abandoned properties, but also uh, attacks on active churches. We also need to look at how Georgian churches are preserved in Turkey's Northeast, as opposed to Armenian churches. There is a major difference. And finally, it's important to note Erdogan's role in the post-coup period, which is the ongoing period, and his history obsession that includes him now thinking that his grandfather was present at Sarikamish, the battle that was justified to launch the Armenian genocide. I also want to note that part of this history obsession that Erdogan is now engaged in is what Christina Maranci, the professor of Armenian studies at Harvard, calls Seljukification of Ani. Now, dissecting or understanding why this destruction happens requires us using some theories. And I know especially students, when they hear theories, they want to run away because a lot of times this complicates things. But it actually, if you understand and apply the right theories, it makes things so much better to understand. And I want to share the research of two scholars who study looting in Turkey. One is Alice von Bieberstein, and she says that a lot of the destruction that's happening is driven by economic factors, but foundationally and fundamentally, it's part of the foundational state violence that has existed in Turkey and continues to exist. Another scholar, Önder Çelik, says that the bureaucracy of licensing looting in Turkey is, quote, an alternative archive for the study of the Armenian genocide, unquote. He finished his PhD dissertation a few years ago at John Hopkins, and it's embargoed until December. I don't think there's any other book I've waited, you know, or dissertation I've been waiting for it to read. I think it will be incredible. Now, my own research suggests a framework that I call heritage securitization. Securitization is a process of making something into an existential threat. You know, ontological you know, studies are basically what this would be under. And in ethno-territorial conflicts, sacredness is securitized. And this happens almost automatically in every conflict. I mean, even in Armenia, Islamic sites create anxiety among the Armenian population, especially today when Tur Azerbaijan is saying Armenia is Western Azerbaijan. So there is this anxiety. I mean, even in our personal lives, right, when we think of our adversaries, our enemies, we imagine them gone at some point, right? So this is normal. But when destruction starts, that is not normal. That's criminal when heritage crime starts. And when an authoritarian regime like Azerbaijan sees value in destroying them through what's called in divergency theories, performance legitimacy, 
gaining popularity in an otherwise dictatorship or going against your enemy. When you marry basically nationalism and authoritarianism, you have what I propose to call sovereign heritage crime, a state engaged in the destruction of unwanted cultural heritage. Now, if we want to further theorize this in Turkey, it's very, it's somewhat different from what Azerbaijan has been doing. In both contexts, heritage has been securitized, but we have not seen complete erasure in Turkey. But we have seen something different. The engagement of people, ordinary people in the process until today, and the issuance of looting licenses is an important part of this. And I would call this each looting a micro reenactment of the Armenian genocide. And the question here is, can heritage be de-securitized? And the answer is absolutely yes, but how do we get to that point is a secret. Now, one obvious answer that had not crossed my mind was Armenian pilgrimages. In 2014, I joined a tour company in Armenia. People did not know what I was researching. I played a tourist, went to the regular route, and when we went to Varagavang, which is in the Van area, the church does not stand in its you know, full structure, but still exists. I saw the interaction between the Kurdish family in the region that sort of is a caretaker and the Armenian tourist operator. Then he told me that over the last several decades, he has established a relationship with his family and they benefit from Armenian visitations. And as a result of that, they take care and try to upkeep the church. Now, that's just one example, but let's zoom out and think of deterring destruction. And this is also very relevant to Artsakh. And there's really two ways about this. One is raising the cost for bad behavior. And that can be naming and shaming, sanctions, international news coverage, as was referenced earlier. And I've, I've had my you know, own guilt in, in, in this, the exposés that have come up in you know, Hyperallergic and the art newspaper, etc. But this also can reinforce securitization. So it's important, but in the long term, unless you know, we're putting uh, this through a legal mindset, and I'm not a lawyer, so maybe a lot of the lawyers in the room are uncomfortable with my suggestions, but really the ultimate goal should be incentivizing preservation and de-securitization. Now, there are many pathways to that, but I want to identify something that can be relevant and realistic, and that's something called an MOU. We all know what that means, Memorandum of Understanding. On the last day of Donald Trump's presidency, the U.S. government signed an MOU with the government of Turkey called Import Restrictions Imposed on Categories of Archaeological and Ethological Material of Turkey. Now you know why I call it just an MOU. It's a mouthful. This MOUs have been around for decades. About 30 countries have such agreements with the United States. And what it really does, it allows the countries to claim properties that may have been looted, uh, illegally or illicitly. And by the way, illicit means in heritage crime studies, something that may not be technically illegal, but it's still unethical. And so the goal for the MOUs for the countries that signed those with the United States is to be able to reclaim the patrimony. Turkey says it wants back archaeological material spanning from nearly 1.2 million years to the year 1770, and ethnological material ranging for the past 19 100 years up to 1923. As I said, there are two dozen, you know, close to 30 of those agreements. Now, the key is that those MOUs are renewable every five years. So the next renewal would be in 2026. There's one reference to Armenians in the MOU that's basically saying Armenian tombstones, hutchcars, etc., would qualify for return. But it's so vaguely written that Armenian coins, including the ones we looked at, would also qualify under this category. Now, some of you might say, well, that's not bad. Maybe Turkey will you know, stop the looting. Unfortunately, that is not the case. We see the Turkish government engaged in incentivizing ongoing looting of Armenian properties, both private properties and community properties. Now, the most important thing about the MOU is something called the unpublished agreement. There is something on paper with each agreement where the country that gets protection in the US commits to certain good behaviors. And this is what the negotiation entails. 
in certain situations, that part is published. We know that Egypt, for example, committed to restoring Jewish cemeteries as a result of the MOU. We don't know what the commitments are toward the US government by the government of Turkey. But we know one thing, that Armenian, Greek, and Syriac stakeholders, both academic and community ones, because I've surveyed everyone I could, have not been consulted in this process. And so maybe that opens a door for the renegotiation part that will be coming soon. And this is where I think this project that's happening can have an impact. And in some indirect ways that I'll mention next in the last slide also, maybe transform some of the policies of Azerbaijan concerning Armenian heritage. Here is an incomplete wish list, just you know, uh, thoughts, uh, uh, food for thought on maybe the things that Armenian stakeholders and Greek and Syriac stakeholders could perhaps negotiate with the US government to have included in the next round of renegotiation with the Turkish government. One could be something I've learned from the research of Professor Akcham that Turkey does not publicize title deeds associated with the Armenian genocide, which is in violation of Turkey's own laws. If that list was publicized, there could be better protections for preventing looting and destruction. Another thing could be allowing additions to the 1936 Religious Foundations list of properties. As some of you may know, in Turkey, religious minorities have to register as foundations and they're governed by boards and you know, they report to the government. So the government has a lot of control over them. And at some point in 1936, a bureaucrat in Turkey told the foundations, you have a couple of months to come up with a list of properties. And that's it, whatever was not provided to them at the time is not included, or if they misspelled something or mislocated something, was kept off. And that can be reopened to adding more. There has to be moratorium and issuing treasure hunting licenses in, in Turkey. Imagine that, you go to Turkey, you go to the local municipality or whatnot, and you apply for a looting license to go loot Armenian properties. There is an online form for that, it's so easy to do. That really has to stop because looting is what continues the destruction of Armenian sites. Preemption of looting can also happen through webcam monitoring of some of the more important sites that are on the verge of collapse. The MOU could also perhaps suggest or require that structural strengthening of collapsing sites such as Maren that Christina Maranzi studies could be done. And perhaps more con controversially, transfer of newly confiscated faith objects to religious foundations of the communities that they belong to. Now the next one is where perhaps a long-term transformation of Azerbaijan's own erasure of Armenian culture can be inspired from. Because in Azerbaijan, Armenian heritage is hyper-securitized and the destruction gives legitimacy to the government. That's why we have the sovereign heritage crime. But we also know that Azerbaijan learns a lot from the Turkish government. Um, and in this process, one thing that might impact both Turkish-Armenian, but also Armenian-Azerbaijan relations is if the Turkish government by the suggestion of the US government, initiated a Turkish-Armenian excavation of Arzan, which is the imperial capital, Tigranakerta, of Tigranes the Great. And this is not my idea. In fact, this was happen happened during a private conversation with Hamlet Petrosian, who discovered Tigranakert, the regional city, which is now under Azerbaijani control. And he mentioned, that maybe one day the Turkish government would approach him or other Armenian archaeologists to actually do this work together. This is one of the most abandoned sites in Turkey. A lot of looting takes place. Most Armenian tour operators actually don't know where Tigran Akert is. They will take them to other sites. And in fact, it took myself some convincing that this was the right uh, site. Professor Sinclair in Cyprus got very upset when I was challenging him. Read his work is incredibly established that this is truly uh, the Armenian capital. And RAA also agrees, which is sort of the final authority on, on Armenian heritage studies. Now, this again could transform perhaps the way that Azerbaijan perceives and securitizes Armenian heritage if it saw 
better relations with Turkey. Now, some of you might say, well, that's going to happen. They're going to rebuild the bridge in Ani. At least that was the agreement. Um, if you follow the work of Stephen Sim, who's been documenting destruction and, and looting through decades, he says actually that there's no way to build that bridge without destroying many sites around it. So it's not really a restoration operation. And finally, as was done with the Egyptian MOU that required restoration and protection of Jewish cemeteries, the MOU renegotiated version could require protection of minority cemeteries. If you notice, I have not included the word Armenian except for Arzan in this, because this should not just be an Armenian effort. Syriacs, Greeks, and others are also impacted in this. In conclusion, I want to say that according to the treasure hunter, the chief one, we saw his screenshot. There are, uh, in Turkey, there are 4 million looters in that country. And the best time to stop looting is before it happens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we'll take the next couple of minutes to set up for our final round table. So please give us two minutes. Absolutely not. All right, so good. Uh, we've reached the final portion of the program, the much dreaded what's next, uh, which is my privilege to moderate. And we are uh, lacking a couple of people who are listed in the program. Uh, and I'm just going to mention by name 
right now the people who have not previously spoken during this uh, and, and omit the others who have spoken, not because I don't think you're wonderful and important people, obviously. So, uh, and then we, I would like to ask those who have, uh, who are new uh, and, and have not previously spoken to encourage them if they would like to say a few words before we open it up for discussion. So we've got uh, Professor Heather Ferguson, who is Associate Professor of Ottoman and Middle Eastern History at Claremont McKenna College. We have Armen Hovanesian, board member and former chairman of the Armenian Bar Association. And we have Professor Justin Walsh, uh, Professor of Art History, Archaeology, and Space Studies at Chapman University. Uh, everyone else, I believe, is already known to you. So uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Professor Ferguson and, and just have the opportunity to offer any thoughts you've accumulated up to this point. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for the invitation. Hegner and I go way back. I showed up to a party at the Fernia's house in Austin when I was a baby master's student in the late 90s, and she was there. And, um, I, you know, I heard all about her dissertation on Damascus and Aleppo, and I was like, wow extraordinary. I'll never be able to do that kind of stuff. So um, thank you for that. And then I come by way of Claremont McKenna and I'm also representing um, the Magrublian Center for Human Rights, which has um, spent a lot of time thinking about questions related to genocide and has more recently picked up on issues related to cultural heritage preservation and destruction. And um, I also know Hegner from my work on the International Journal of Islamic Architecture, where we've spent a lot of time kind of thinking about cultural heritage destruction. And I um, think it has been important to like reiterate the point that Lemkin's original definition of genocide did certainly include a reference to cultural destruction, but that has been kind of sidelined, even though it was brought back up in the Rome statutes and is certainly part of conversations in terms of international human rights. And it's, it's really um, something that I want to kind of concentrate on just really briefly, um, because I'm also here mostly just as an educator, a historian of the Ottoman and Middle East. Um, I teach the Armenian genocide in some capacity all the time, often through the question of heritage. And every single semester, including this one last week, we studied with first year humanities students, um, Operation Nemesis, not Bogassians, um, big tome, but a small graphic novel that was originally published in 2015 and is sadly already out of print. So what's interesting to me there is the way in which like narratives of denial and ignorance and like willful ignorance, I think is perpetuated and that education, especially in the humanities is a key part of ensuring that new generations are aware of this and that vocabularies and terminology really matter. And also thinking about how um, genocide as Armenians and Jews and others remind us is not an event, but an ongoing process. And of course, Artsakh reminds us of that. We can also think of course about the endangered sites in occupied East Jerusalem that the Armenian patriarchy is attempting to protect. And we should um, think as well about the way in which ongoing processes of cultural and human destruction um, within the context of Israel, Palestine, and Gaza also remind us of cultural destruction like we saw in Ukraine as a key component of erasure and that preservation tactics and being aware of the death of cultural heritage is also being aware of the death of a human history and thus of a human future. And if we deny the suffering of one group, we actually limit the possibility for us to find restorative mechanisms of restitution for other groups. So in this moment where we're thinking about what's next in terms of restitution politics, I think what's next is also us to reaffirm something that has been really critiqued, like the limits of international human rights law 
but maybe this is time for us to like reinforce our belief in humanity if we really mean our belief in shared humanity every single human life every single act of destruction and with that collective awareness and sensibility that maybe we can together change the frameworks and terminology and say that um, we we can build toward a future in which these kind of acts of willful denial are no longer a part of our classrooms and no longer part of our legal systems and no longer a possible um, denial within our international legal systems either. So I'm sorry, I kind of went on for a little bit, but. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, I guess we'll progress uh, alphabetically. Armand Hovanesian. Um, my father, Professor Richard Hovanesian, were he here today, would be rather satisfied with the program and also he would be somewhat disappointed. He would be satisfied because he long thought and longer taught that Armenian history and the path forward to be more fully embraced should be taken out of the confines of Armenians only and shared in the broader context of world history and developments. He would be somewhat uh, realistic and pessimistic as he was sometimes because we are way behind. Others have gone forward and we seem not to be able to go forward even though we're trying. First, I'd like to thank the Armenia Promise Institute and uh, Dr. Eric Israelian, Professor Anne Karagosian, Professor Taner Aksham, and Professor Michael Basler for initiating this effort. I think that last year's conference in March and this follow-up in certain ways are a watershed to help stimulate an understanding of comparative causes and effects of international destruction. And the one that's, that was highlighted today, the case studies, really centered on the Jewish experience after World War II and the Armenian experience after World War I with a segue into uh, Ukraine. And although there are overarching similarities between the Jewish experience after the Holocaust and the Armenian experience after the genocide, uh, we have to confront also the proverbial elephant in the room. The proverbial elephant in the room is that Ottoman Turkey committed a genocide and after its initial acceptance of it in the first few years after doing so, has put on a full court, 100 and now nine year press of denial. Denial, relativiz relativization, rationalization. And the reason that why that's important is because it, it retards, it inhibits the path forward in certain ways. By contrast, part of world memory, part of American memory, is what happened to the Jews at the hands of the Nazis. It's inculcated in us. And so to the great credits, credit of the advocates for Jewish reparations, Jewish uh, for Holocaust-related reparations and restitution, the major differences, as, as both the ambassador uh, Eisenstadt stated and others, you had a repentant West Germany, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, who said in Armenian, Ner Orutyun, Ner Orutyun, they came to their knees and said, I'm sorry. And they also cultivated an entire Western and ultimately Eastern European culture of contrition. Did they do it on their own? No, maybe they were coerced. Maybe it took the likes of Professor Basler and his predecessors to make them come to the table. The Armenian genocide, and, and I know I'm going a little long, but I, I think we need to dr drive this difference as much as there's similarities. The Armenian Bar Association recently entered into an MOU with the Armenian Genocide Museum and Institute in Yerevan, Armenia. It was mentioned by, by Ambassador Eisenstadt today. 
as probably a place, a resource where this type of activity can occur. And Professor Harutun Marutian today in a text says, I look forward to following the panel and he sent me some background materials, but we all Armenians know what he said. We understand it. The Armenians were killed and massacred on their own homeland, an Armenian people of one faith, of one religion, of one language, and of one cultural heritage. It was perpetrated by one state that continues to deny. In the Jewish experience, the Holocaust happened in or through about 20 different Western and Eastern European countries now. Imagine that. They had guilt on their hands because either they turned the other way or they were complicit in it, like the Hungarians and the railroads and, and, the, and the like. And so that became through, through public uh, awareness and through publicity, through books and movies and Oscar nominated and Oscar winning movies, it became part of that culture, part of our culture. And so that's the challenge really, is how do we get it into the mainstream? It's by starting with baby steps, things like this. But I will close with this, part of the pessimism that Professor Hovhannessian would probably say that it's not going to drive us. Pessimism will, will lead to movement and optimism ultimately. Mr. Schoenberg today gave a really gripping, captivating explanation about uh, his bringing the case on behalf of Maria Altman versus Austria and how he recovered uh, the um, the uh, lady, the, the, the woman in gold painting. What he didn't tell you is, and I really enjoyed and appreciated his forthrightness about how he viewed the Washington principles and about the terrorism declaration. But what he didn't tell you is this, that the United States, as much as being a land of freedom and justice and opportunity and everybody gets his or her day in court, it just ain't so. One short month before President Biden acknowledged the Armenian genocide in early 2021, the United States Supreme Court, in unanimous decisions, decided in the Jewish Holocaust-related art recovery efforts that the heirs to the victims of the Jewish Holocaust who were trying to recover paintings from, against Austria and against, uh, against Germany, against Austria, could not sue uh, um, Germany and, and, and Austria, or, uh, Germany and Hungary, excuse me. You know why? It's really a, it's a counterintuitive thing. As, as Schoenberg today was saying, you can't sue a foreign state, their sovereign immunity, but they have certain exceptions. One was this taking of property in violation of international law. Until those two 2021 decisions, genocide is in violation of international law. And so you had various intermediate courts which said, which said that, you know what, you have to, that's part of the exception. Go ahead and sue those states. Sue those states, get it back. But now the United States Supreme Court comes in three years ago and says, uh, there's an exception to the exception. A government that you're trying to sue because it's holding on to your family's personal movable property can take property from its own citizens. That's called the domestic takings exception. So for our purposes here, if we are uh, descendants of the, of, the, of the survivors and victims of the Armenian genocide, unless our unless our great grandparents and, and, and uh, grandparents were American citizens at the time, we can't sue Turkey. We can't sue Turkey or its agencies or instrumentalities. And that's why I'll pass the mic, why this uh, 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 Holocaust expropriated art uh, recovery act is very important 
You're not going to get be able to go against the government. Most people aren't going to be able to go against the government of Turkey or its agencies or instrumentalities. But to the extent that Professor Basler and uh, Professor Aksham and the wonderful students can mine materials and you find some pieces of art in American museums, maybe we can go and try to get, as has been said in the Jewish Holocaust experience, a drop of justice. Professor Walsh. That's, that's tough to follow. Um, it's, it's a bitter, bitter uh, message, unfortunately. Um, just as by way of introduction, um, I'm an archeologist. Uh, primarily, I also teach art history at Chapman University where I met my colleague, uh, Michael Basler, almost immediately upon arriving there uh, 13 years ago. Um, and I started my work in Sicily at a site called Morgantina which has become infamous for having been looted over decades. And we would see holes appear on the site uh, in, the mor in the morning, we would find them after people have been digging uh, overnight. Um, and that big cultural heritage protection became very important to me. So once I got my first job uh, after getting my PhD, uh, I started teaching a cultural heritage, kind of an ethics course for our art history, grad students at the institution I was at now for my undergrads at Chapman. And I've been doing it for almost 20 years. And since I've been at Chapman, every time I've had Michael come, oh, Michael, you're over there, sorry. Couldn't see across the people, but Michael. Uh, so having Michael come and to talk about his work. And uh, most recently, last semester, he was talking about this project and was really excited about it. And uh, he knew that I had also been doing some research as well as teaching on the subject and uh, asked if I would come. And so I have some notes that are, uh, in, in some respects, reactions to what we saw today, reactions to what I understand about the project, but I have no background in Armenian visual or material culture. So please take it in those terms. These are more general ideas. The first thing that I uh, want to say is that this is an extraordinary moment, uh, notwithstanding that particular situation that you just described. But it's an extraordinary moment in cultural heritage research uh, and the idea of rest, restitution. Uh, when I first started teaching uh, cultural heritage in 2006, um, you could maybe say that we had a snowball, but that has become an avalanche of stories and also of uh, events and developments where uh, you have, uh, last semester when I was teaching this course, it's like every single day I was sending something to my students that was in the newspaper about some some situation that related to this, uh, this set of issues, um, whether it was contemporary modern art but, or antiquities or, or anything in between. Um, you know, stories about uh, the arrests, not only of looters, but now starting to be of dealers in South Asian art, Cambodian art, collectors giving things back, and the ancient Near East and Greek and Roman art as, and archaeology as well. So there's at least some something we can take uh, positive from the situation that we're in, that this is, this is tending in the right direction. It's taken a long time, undoubtedly, but starting to tend in the right direction, and that's that's largely, I think, actually due to the work uh, on Holocaust issues, actually, in the 1990s, um, as well as um, more recognition from governments like the US that they need to, they need to support these issues uh, internationally. The second point is that, obviously, museums and collectors are still learning lessons that they should have learned a long time ago. Uh, and I think about issues that we see around uh, the United States such as the failure of almost every museum to abide by the 1990 Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, the extent to which they are restituting objects or not, the extent to which they're acknowledging the bad practices that they participated in and showing that they've learned from it, the extent to which they're being transparent or showing remorse, which they basically never do. Um, those sorts of things do need to develop. Uh, with regard to stories where uh, or, or events where restitution actually happens, um, I, I would suggest that um, groups like the Armenian population, or let's say particularly like the Armenian church, in the case of the Zaytun Gospels in 2015, um, where restitution is demanded, one thing that I really think can be added to that process is that these are opportunities that, sorry, excuse me, that opportunities for engagement with the, the affected communities should be part of the conversation. That is to say that I think 
uh, that the objects are only the beginning of, of that discussion. So for example, with the Zaytun Gospels, I, as I understand it, I wasn't part of this, so I, I only know kind of secondhand from, from Michael, for example, but uh, you know, the, the pages are still at the Getty. The Getty says that they belong to the Armenian church. That was the resolution and that this is seen as a positive thing. But what has the Getty done for the Armenian population? Have they reached out? Have they created events uh, to connect with the Armenian population of Los Angeles or beyond? Uh, have they gone and, and uh, presented um, presentations about, or educational uh, opportunities for folks from this group who's, who had their, um, their heritage taken from them and ended up in this, the wealthiest cultural institution in the world? I don't think so. But in the future, those sorts of things should be part of the ask. Those sorts of things are important because that's how you not just get restitution, but actually, as Heather just said a second ago, restoration. I think that's really crucial. Uh, fourth, uh, I would really want to emphasize how diplomacy and law enforcement can be engaged uh, with uh, to, to create um, ways of, of uh, getting better results. So um, Simon very nicely explained the whole MOU situation and the bilateral agreements that the U.S. State Department negotiates through what's called the Cultural, Pri uh, Cultural Property Advisory Committee, uh, which consists of all different kinds of stakeholders, but which votes whether to support a country like uh, Turkey, in the case you suggested, or it could be Belize or Mexico, uh, to get one of these five-year bilateral agreements. And I pretty, I, as far as I know, Armenia hasn't applied for one. But I would suggest that in the context of the Artsakh situation, this is an ongoing conflict that Armenia would have a very good case yeah. for applying for this. And that's how you get the attention of, for example, customs enforcement agents. Once those agreements go into place, you get, they actually start like, okay, we need to learn what this stuff looks like and we need to pursue people who are bringing it into the country because you can be sure that where you have conflict, you're going to have ant uh, cultural heritage, antiquities, what have you, coins, leaving that country and coming into the United States where all the money is. And they won't go and look for that. The agents won't look for that unless there's an agreement in place. So that's something that I think would be really positive. Finally, I just wanna say the student engagement stuff that you've been doing is fantastic. Uh, in this in this project, the Aglarp project, um, and I, it clearly pays huge dividends for the future because you're also developing people who are passionate about these specific things and can pass the knowledge and excitement on. Uh, the one thing I would recommend is engaging with computer science people, people in data analytics and in, who can code because then you can do things like you can scrape museum websites. You don't need to go through and search through their system every time. You just get all the data and you build a database and you search it yourself and you can do it very quickly. Um, and then you can also archive it and you can archive those web pages that, uh, that have the individual uh, item information. So if you've got Armenian items, manuscript pages, whatever it is, send that to archive.org so that it's there permanently and that that, that uh, site is automatically checking to see if the museum is changing the page because they've noticed that people are looking at it and they don't want people looking at it. Or especially if they do restitute it, then they take down that page and that information is gone. So you wanna make sure that that's there. Those are some, some ideas that I have in response, thinking about what's next. But love to hear the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your, for your remarks here. Um, so what we have now to do, we have a, a short list of questions. It could be a very long list of questions that I will pose to the uh, assembled multitude here. And anyone who wishes to, to be heard can, can answer. And then we will leave some time for audience Q&A. And a couple of these are questions that people have sent to me in anticipation of this. And I wanted to actually work in a couple of those. And I'd like to start with one of those. And the question uh, may have a simple answer or not. What are the rights or obligations of museums or institutions to reveal or withhold information? So if I am a researcher, presumably with a legitimate inquiry, and I contact Museum X about such and such item and its uh, provenance, do they have any obligation to answer my inquiry? 
Wait, does this work? Yeah. yeah. Um, in theory, um, public institutions or institutions whose uh, mission statements are to serve the public good that are dedicated to research, etc., cetera, um, are supposed to have a level of transparency, but oftentimes they determine that. Um, and there's a, a tremendous variety among institutions. Some are very open um, and it's very easy to work there. Some have become more open over the years. Uh, some require you to have um, credentials in a way that they determine. Um, for example, uh, if you want to work at the you know, archival repositories at the Watson Library, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know, there's an application process. And so they, you know, not anyone, you know, the wonderful high school student, Levon Wright, I, I don't, he would not be able to get in, for example. You have to be, you know, a legitimate researcher or a student writing a thesis and so on. Um, and that in part has to do with, you know, space and ability and so on. But I think there's also a, a large amount of dragging of feet and a little bit of obfuscation and a little bit of uh, delay. Um, and so the, uh, there's, um, in a typical museum, uh, whether art museum or anthropological museum, will have archives related to their objects. And a lot of times, even if you get access to those, you're seeing only part of it. There's more that um, you know you don't see as a researcher, and that's in part because maybe they contain you know financial information or other kinds of information that's covered by sort of issues that need to remain more uh, more private. But um, so the short answer is that uh, we have made huge inroads in transparency. Uh, for example, our wonderful banners um, are um, are possible because these are images from the Zaytun Gospels, the pages that are um, at the Getty, and the Getty has made their um, all of their artworks high resolution images available to download freely through their um, open source program. And it's amazing. So you can take these images and enlarge them and manipulate them and learn about this art. So that those are really great advances that um, we didn't have before. Sometimes we didn't have even five years ago. But um, as many researchers uh, have found out, for example, Jonathan Petropoulos, who is you know an amazing scholar at um, the Magrublian Center who has uh, written many very important books on Holocaust looted art in the art world during the Second World War. Um, you know, there's sometimes there are, even Jonathan can't get to certain files. So um, I think that's a problem. And it, it, as activists, that's one of the things we need to push for. More transparency, more access. Um, if, if I can just add on to that, you know, so these are, I mean, we we think of them as public institutions because they're they're not like individual collectors or something like that. In fact, they are private nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. but that raises an important issue because we we don't have a national museum, the Smithsonian Institution, but apart from that, we don't we don't have a national museum that, like in most other countries. There's a Ministry of Culture and that runs all the museums basically in a, in a given country. We don't have that here, but we have the fact that they are nonprofit organizations, which means that they are subsidized by us all as taxpayers. And therefore, I'm not the first person to make this point. I think it was Jason Felch uh, who wrote Chasing or co wrote Chasing Aphrodite, if you know that book, uh, who first said this to me anyway. Um, but the point is that we should be able to demand more from them as a result of that. Not only should we have high expectations because we tend to believe that museums are a force for good to the extent that they are or not, is obviously a point of, of debate here at this very room. But uh, we should be able to demand more of them as a result of that, and we should we should hold them to account for that, I would just say. Thank you. Um, so what what is or what should be going forward the role of the Armenian government and or other Armenian state institutions in this process, as in, in the Republic of Armenia? You don't have to be Armenian to answer the question. Start with the MOU. I mean, right? I mean, how Simon and I and many of our friends have been saying this for years. 
um, that's a doable thing. And if you have, if you're a state, you can do that. If you're not a state, you can't. So it seems like this is one process. Yes, it's not easy. You have to go through a process. It's complicated. You have it's, it's work, but it would it would be a real advancement, and it would then trigger certain kinds of protections and international law enforcement. And I, I don't know why um, our sort of um, suggestions have fallen on deaf ears. I mean, there are three issues that seems to me very important. Number one, I mean, before Armenian government, it is the task of diaspora organizations here to put this on their agenda, looted Armenian art and recovery of this art. This hasn't been done yet. So this is a task, of course, our job also as academia to push Armenian uh, grassroots organizations to come together and to develop an agenda on that. This should be on the agenda of Armenian organizations. They should come together. And the other two important point that Armen just also raised again, we should, I mean, I, I'm going to repeat what I said in my introductory remarks. We should work towards UCLA or Los Angeles principles of Armenian looted art that makes, for example, the museums uh, a mandatory that they reveal their uh, what they their inventories what they have and it might not be enough. Then we should work towards here act the Armenian Genocide Recovery Act that goes through parliament. We need really, as Armen rightly pointed out, I mean, we need some legal tools in our hands. We cannot leave everything to, uh, to the morality of the institutions and world. So these are my three points. The only thing that I'd add to that is um, whether we should do that by choice or preference, uh, diaspora organizations, community groups, uh, that is the situation we're in because the current government of Armenia has forsaken everything west of it. They're considering taking down Ararat from our national symbols. They've given up all rights and claims to any cultural property, by the way, in the historic Armenian provinces. And they've done a lot more to jeopardize the standing of the Armenian nation outside of the Republic of Armenia. Seven of the 10 million Armenians on planet Earth who live outside of Armenia to actually make claims. Because when you have a government that should be speaking for a people, but which does not, and it goes ahead and neglects and it waves, it waves or is it stopped to then argue later on or then we are somehow compromised because we are Armenians. They say, well, wait a minute, Yerevan just said, hey, you can't go to Van. Armin, you can't go to Erzurum and Garin to take your grandfather's uh, holy relics from his house in the village of Tzitoch. So, so we're blocked there. That's why, whether by preference or, uh, or because we're stuck with this, it's people like this, it's, group, it's groups of professionals like these, that have to push the ball and move the ball forward. No one else is gonna do it for us. Michael. Yeah, I wanted to post um, interview or post recording remarks that Ambassador Eisenstadt said to us as we were talking, is you referred back to 23 Jewish organizations coming together and make creating this Jewish claims conference. It's the longer name, but it's has claims in it in Germany. And he said, kind of laughingly, it's difficult to get 23 Jews to agree to something, 23 are Jewish organizations. But there was one person, Nahum Goldman, who got everybody together and said, we need to do this. And that organization, the Claims Conference, and its affiliate, the World Jewish Restitution Organization, still exists. One can look at those organizations there's who well, i can criticize i can say they're not doing enough they should be doing this but the point is that he wanted to make to all of us is um getting a unity you know like lee boyd said in the documentary put the unity in the community 
and have somebody, you know, or an organization to go ahead and, and focus on this specific issue and know that when they approach, whether it's a museum or a government, uh, maybe not at this point Turkey, but maybe at some point Turkey, then you go ahead you know, and do so. I also want to remind um, that when the Holocaust restitution movement began in the 1990s, the first set of claims were not made against Germany, they were made against neutral Switzerland. And then it went to French banks and German banks. And only after those claims were filed and negotiations began, then you had claims being made against Germany. Um, I also want to add to what um, Armin said, litigation should never be <laughs> the, the first step. It's expensive. It takes a long time. You don't know what the result is going to be. I think Randy Schoenberg's presentation showed that. And I think what Armin added, that yeah, there was a lawsuit using that precedent against Germany. And it went to, before the United States Supreme Court. I was one of the ones that filed an amicus brief unsuccessfully, where the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. You, know, you need to be the national of that state. And the German Jews who were persecuted at that time were still German citizens, even though they had a J on their passport. They're still German nationals, and we don't want to go ahead and open up that precedent so that, you know, and the, the Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion, I mean, you remember, says, we would be surprised if German nationals started making claims against us. And so you can see these surprises that occurred. Uh, you can ask the question, well, what happened in the um, Clint case? We didn't know this. Randy knew this, but nobody paid attention to it. At the time that the lawsuit, at the time that the, the property, those art pieces were taken um, from uh, Mr. Blackbauer, he had a Czech passport. <laughs> and that, no one paid attention to it. It, did, it wasn't a fact that had to be considered anywhere all the way up to the Supreme Court. And yet the Supreme Court looking at that second case said, aha, and they found a way to go ahead and deny that case. There's another case in the last month of the Casero versus Spain litigation that's been going on over 15 years. And it's gone to the Supreme Court once. We hope it's gonna to go to the Supreme Court again because the Ninth Circuit just denied um, the claims of the survivors for paintings that everybody agrees was stolen by the Nazis and they're in a museum in Spain and the Ninth Circuit going through its kind of procedural um, machinations that all of us as lawyers know when we do civil procedure came up at the end of that, no, no recovery. It's interesting and not to get too legal, the reason for that is that the United, in the United States, you cannot pass stolen property and that person who receives that stolen property, whether he or she knows about it, doesn't know about it, that person does not have clean title. Some, but the rightful owner can come back and get it from you. In Europe, in Spain, they don't have that. They have prescriptive titles so that after a passage of a few years only, so that court, the Casir case, they said the Spanish law applies, not United States law. So they went through a choice of law analysis. They ended up that Spanish law is going to apply to this. And aha, Spanish law says that, you know, the person who got it, whether or not they knew that it was stolen, that period of years pass, go home. I mean, it's very unfortunate. But at least in the United States, you know that if the courthouse doors and if the judge's minds open a, a little bit more, that stolen property can never pass and be cleaned of title. Once it's stolen, it's stolen. And if you have a right to it, you can get it back in the United States. I think this conversation is also interesting because um, it brings up something that there's like shifting vocabularies and terms that we're using because on the one hand referencing denial and destruction as a series of events that took place maybe of course we think maybe beginning in the 1870s and moving forward but with a punctuated epistemic rupture in 1915 and 1916. Um, so on the one hand it's an events 
denials committed by Ottoman Empire, denied by Tur uh, Turkey, denied by the US for geopolitical reasons until you know, 2021. But on the other hand, we've also heard conversations about like ongoing processes, remnants of Armenian communities and Armenian art and material objects um, throughout the region of the so-called Middle East or you know, Afro-Eurasia, et cetera. And it, it made me think of something I forgot to mention earlier, which is um, the missing pieces of, of course, is such an important book for referencing this, but then at least Samer Gian's new book is called Remnants. And the reason I bring that up is that it's also the embodiment of life and death in living death, the Islamized, Turkified bodies. And it made me think of ways in which we think of, you know, the death of the material object, which survives also um, and is commemorated. But I think we also need to think of like the living bodies here and in other contexts who are sustaining the memory of um, the, the, the way in which material objects continue to be an ongoing restoration of our vision of um, what it means to be Armenian, but also what it means to be human in the world. So I wanted to name drop remnants and um, the embodiment of the material in the human and vice versa. Thank you. Um, well, audience questions. I see a hand. One yes, more. It's better. My, my question has to do with this idea of um, talking about looted art in the context of it having happened. And yet what we're struggling with right now is the fact that looted art is happening um, in in Artsakh and it's essentially happening by the same people um, and uh, in 2020 when there was a ceasefire the people in Stepanakert were looking up the hill and seeing the uh, the dome of Gazanchetsots be completely replaced by something that isn't um, what it was ever intended to be and so um, it, it's a little bit difficult for us to be experiencing this, talking about, I mean, as an Armenian, talking about what is happening 100 years ago and how to preserve that and bring that back, where um, everything that's happened in the last three years has brought up so much trauma that it's difficult to move beyond that. So I, while we talked about Ukraine and we talked about what was happening in, in Ukraine, I was a little bit saddened and disappointed that we didn't bring that close that loop at this conference, at least to talk about what was happening in Artsakh. And there's quite a bit of material that I think Simon could have spoken to because he's done quite a bit of research in that area. And he did speak to Nachichevan, but again, for me, what's missing is what is happening today. Yeah, so how can we uh, integrate that into this discussion more uh, briefly, but uh, at least some pointers? Um, that was my fault. Um, I could have spoken more about Artsakh, but I thought it's important to understand why looting and destruction takes place, both the, the theory and the processes. Um, but I agree that you know the Armenian community is going through the trauma trauma of, of the destruction uh, right now. Um, I just want to make references to some resources that people are interested in looking up. I already mentioned Caucasus Heritage Watch, the incredible satellite reporting. RAA also has a website called artsoftmonuments.org where they have a virtual database of several thousand monuments. And finally, monumentwatch.org, which is headed by Dr. Hamlet Petrosian, has incredible reporting uh, based on social media monitoring of what's, what's happening. Um, and I agree there needs to be more, uh, more awareness about what's going on. Um, and I hope that conversation you know, will, will continue in other fora. Then I have a question. Oh. No, I insist. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me come out there. All right, I give up. Or we could do the Chippendale chipmunk routine after you. Anyhow, I wanted to thank everybody for being here and uh, giving us all this opportunity. 
Um, I think, I can't remember which of the distinguished participants mentioned it, but something about um, museums in Artsakh and if they had been looted, if art objects had been taken or not, that was kind of left up in the air. Uh, I think it's important to note right now that, uh, first of all, um, genocide didn't happen. The genocide is ongoing. For the last hundred years or more, there is at every turn an ongoing, constant uh, cultural appropriation, erasure, erasure, wherever possible, Armenians are erased. Where it's not possible, their objects and their heritage are erased, right? And narratives are constantly, both within the cultural uh, milieu, within the political economy reality of the world, narratives are being propounded and created that edge towards genocide. The genocide did not stop. It has not stopped to this day. And you can see it by what is happening on the borders of Armenia itself now. And what has occurred in Artsakh is a complete looting of every museum that existed. Carpet, textile museums, artworks, min the Mineral Gemologic Museum of Shushi, and the Shushi Dome isn't the only thing that has already been removed. Many already have been documented, as many of you know. So let's start looking at things. Let's call them by their names, shall we? For the sake of expediting something in a world where already not only are enemies of the Armenian people working, now within the state of Armenia, we have a complete soft power sort of tragedy occurring where the values and ethics and the, the, the history of a people is being put under uh, danger by Thank collaborationists. I, I, I know, question? Is no, I, 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 I took a question from that, which, okay. is, which is, can anyone speak to the, the uh, condition of Armenian museums that were in existence in, in Artsakh uh, and, and whether the, the treasures they contain or contained uh, have been removed to safety or, or no? Um, so unfortunately, most inventory was not evacuated um, except for the Tikhan Gerd Archaeological Museum and I think uh, uh, Berzor or Lachin ethnographic museum but if i may expand it and also go back to the um, question Please. um genocide is obviously what happened in in Artsakh. in fact you know this is i, I know this is a controversial thing when there's bloodless removal of people you know ethnic cleansing is the preferred term but i was speaking with on a panel with uh, lemkin uh, institute's president was there and she made this incredible case. She said what happened in Artsakh in September is one of the most successful genocides in history, you know, completely erased. But when it comes to culture as um, emotive and healing the term genocide or cultural genocide can be, it, it's not a helpful path to um, prevention uh, of, of destruction. Um, and the discrimination uh, framework that the Armenian government is using, uh, maybe the only thing we can um, give credit to that government, even though it's done by professionals, not, not the elected leadership. But the discrimination framework is much more applicable and helpful here because genocide has to show intent, whereas discrimination can be effect. And we also have the issue of sovereignty. As much as we hate it, the world does not recognize Armenian sovereignty over Artsakh. So Azerbaijan can say, well, that's their own patrimony. Doesn't mean they can you know, destroy it, they have a right to destroy it. We don't have a right to kill people in our homes even though it's, it's our home, um, but the discrimination framework is, is much more, uh, I think, helpful in, in this. Well, I have to disagree with you, uh, but I won't go into an argument now. I think Thank those, you. I appreciate those uh, sort of uh, rationalizations, that time is over. Um, Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I wanna give a possible lawyer litigation answer and see what Professor Fielder has to say to this and, and what Arma has. I'm thinking about the, the um, prosecution of President Putin and the Children's Rights Commissioner before the International Criminal Court. Notice in that particular case, when you go ahead and do a criminal prosecution at the international level, there's no such thing as head of state immunity. Then 
notice that in that particular case, the ICC prosecutor did not just indict President Putin, but the Children's Rights Commissioner. So I'm sort of brainstorming here. Who are the individuals who directed the people on the ground in Artsakh to take that stuff? And if you can find those individuals, those are individuals that are subject to criminal prosecution. Mm. At the least, track them. Find out if they ever leave you know, Turkey or Artsakh and they come to the United States or come to some other country, there could be ways in order to go ahead and go criminally against those individuals. Because as Professor Fielder mentioned, and she knows much more about this than I do, these are violations of international law. And so if we find the culp the same kind of you know, culpable people that did that in Ukraine, Russians, they also should be in our sights as individuals that when they leave Russia, something bad can happen to them. Would you like to uh, add to that? I totally agree with what Michael just said. I think it's this is um, another very interesting um, follow-up to what Armin said. We're seeing it's just so much harder in the courts these days when we're talking about, for example, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities litigation, when we're talking about maybe the Alien Tort Claims Act in the United States, even when we talk about criminal prosecutions in our in our own countries, it's been really interesting because we saw a lot, a big rise in universal jurisdiction after the Eichmann case, and it really came to a peak in the 90s. So when we heard about the woman in gold case, we saw this not just in the United States, but in a lot of different places around the world where it was easier to bring these kind of cases in courts. But now we've seen, as we do, things the pendulum always swings, and we've seen it in our US courts. I think that answers. Um, some of the reasons behind why we saw such a different result in some of these more recent cases, but it just makes it a lot harder. So Michael's right. We have to think about every single thing we have in our toolbox. We have to think about the international criminal law. It's always jurisdictional. There's always jurisdictional problems, but the more we can, the more tools that we have, the more we can think about it. I think that's really important. I, I, I am, very saddened by the swing away from being able to to have these solutions that we did have in the 90s and the early 2000s so that just means we have to be a lot more creative and i think what you've talked about and having these principles these principles pave the way for legislation and right now when the courts are not giving this jurisdiction for these kind of cases they're saying well there's federalism problems or this is not the court is not a politically elected body so we have to save that for the politically elected branches that's why what we're doing here is so important that we get legislation passed because that makes it easier we get the legislation the courts then have the permission and even the mandate to do to do those kind of things so i think we we do need to focus on the criminal part we do need to focus on getting these principles um getting that's the framework for the legislation so, the only thing that I'd add ahead. to that, and maybe for just a little background for our non-legal audience, what uh, Professor Felder and Professor Basil were talking about is the in International Criminal Court, otherwise known as the Rome Statute. Ar uh, statute. Armenia just acceded uh, to the Rome Statute, ratified it, approved it. And what does that do? That, that allows for the prosecution of an individual who is accused of a of a certain set of really bad crimes. You sue somebody. You can't sue the state of Azerbaijan. You can't sue the state of Russia. You can sue an individual. You had that with Milosevic of Yugoslavia. So as a, just as a, not a counter, but as an alternative to Professor Basler, well, first of all, both states usually have to be parties to this ICC in order for there to be jurisdiction. That is, if we wanted to prosecute somebody or to have the, uh, the prosecutor bring charges against somebody in Azerbaijan, I wonder who, uh, uh, in Azerbaijan, one would think that Azerbaijan need be a member of the Rome Statute. Wrong. If that genocide or if that crime actually had consequences in Armenia, 
that is 120,000 people dispossessed, depopulated, forced out of their ancestral homeland. And its effects happen in Armenia. Gotcha, Azerbaijan. Gotcha. But it's political will. The government of Armenia that no longer looks west beyond, you know, Ararat and says, you know, Armenia stops at the Araks River, even for historical purposes, probably is not going to bring a case against the person against whom the case should be brought, and that is Aliyev. So point so there is jurisdiction, but I wouldn't hold your breath for Armenia to go ahead and invoke it. So to risk injecting a note of optimism, uh, I was thinking earlier when um, we were watching Ambassador Eisenstadt speak that I, at the risk of being wrong, I, I doubt that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Ambassador Eisenstadt would have spoken about this subject in the terms that he spoke about it in, in that video. And I can't say exactly why, but certainly one strong reason why he is probably where he is at on this subject today is because of the tremendous work that's been done by scholars over the past several decades on the Armenian genocide generally. Um, so to conclude with a question, maybe for the, the troika of, of uh, Michael, uh, Eknar, and, and Tanner, what needs to be done to continue this specific research project, other than, of course, money. Well, money, but, <laughs> um, but I think we um, we approach by we, I mean not the royal we, but the three of us. <laughs> we um, we had these this long-term image, this dream, this sort of digital Benin image that we want to build toward. But there are many steps along the way that we can achieve. Um, and I think in the shorter term, um, we need to you know, complete our basic database. So Sanjian 2.0, let's say, mm. uh, but updated, um, working like Justin said, with the data science people and the computer people to really use the digital tools in our toolbox um, and to really make that um, something that can be made uh, can be made public. So instead of move from the raw notes, raw research notes to something that can be presented. Um, but there are intermediate stages along the way. I mean, I, I think Ani can write an article about all the interesting things that she's finding about Arthur Alfred Pope and his various correspondence and their machinations. And there's a lot of interest in these issues. Um, uh, I think we could, um, like Ambassador Eisenstadt said, publicity is so important. I mean, we've discovered so many poignant stories of, uh, um, of objects, how they ended up in various places. Some of them have to do with Agla, some of them do not. Um, and these stories need to be told. People are interested in them. So I can imagine uh, ways in which we make these objects speak about their experiences and what that pretends. Um, so I would like to see more research, more publication, uh, building up to the bigger goal, but not let's not let that bigger goal be too far too far ahead, too far. Yeah. Michael, please. Money, <laughs> but let me yeah explain what I mean by that. Um, when we started the project over the summer, it was just the three of us, and with really one expert, uh, Professor Wadba. Um, if we could duplicate Hegnar and have two, three, four art historians, and then Simon is my duplicate. <laughs> okay. She's already speaking in the second person, first person plural. So, right. uh... and then have more students. I mean, the interest is so great, uh, Mark. When we reached out and we went ahead and made the announcement. And this is for the summer. This is a project that you law students in any law school, in any you know art um, art department can do. 
there was a lot of interest in this, but the three of us just couldn't handle it. If, we, if we're gonna grow, um, we need more people on board in order to do it. I mean, I don't have anything to add, or no, I have something to add, additional to what, what already said. Uh, we have to institutionalize these efforts. This is the most important part. We have to create a kind of a, I don't know the English term for it, vendor or, or a, a kind of a body that continuously work on that subject. Armenian genocide, looted art, should be an institutional part of any academic endeavor. So this is the job, this is the things that I'm taking out from our conversation, adding to this digitizing and getting a good documentary and uh, I mean the and so on and so forth. The other important task that I'm putting in front of myself to take the documentary, to take some other materials coming out from this discussion, bring these to the community. I think we need community involvement in that process. What I got from Eisenstadt or from uh, Schoenberg, Schoenberg, publicity and public pressure. So we should go and reach out to Armenian communities and explain the importance of the thing that we are doing that this is a part of bigger reparation movement. I understand my Armenian friends. I have been living with them almost more than 30 years. Compared to denialism and compared to what has been lost there, one or two paintings, are you kidding me, is the normal reaction of any Armenians. And we should make clear that really this efforts, the restitution of looted art, going after them, is really an important triggering element for us to create a bigger restitution movement that put Turkey also under pressure. So we have enough materials in our hand to do, and we will take as a good job. I mean, we will continue working on it. And we have Hasmik and Nanur, so those are we want to make sure that they're continuing. Oh yeah, thank you so much, really. They, they are amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to this panel. Uh, Nanor, do you have the last word? Then I say thank you to all and thank you to the panel for your time. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that fantastic discussion. Uh, we have now reached the end of our program. Uh, thank you again to our co-sponsors, the Fowler Museum at UCLA, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, the Promise Institute for Human Rights, the Mugoblian Center for Human Rights at Claremont McKenna College, and the uh, Institute for Transnational Law at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. Uh, we are grateful for your support and look forward to future collaborations. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in and coming today. Uh, we hope you feel leading better equipped to tackle these ambitious pursuits. Uh, and please refer to the Promise Armenian Institute website, Instagram, and Facebook for information on future events. Thank you all again and have a great weekend. Um, yes. Much. It was amazing, really. Thank you.